No, I mean at the time. Folks, we're going to get started. Before we do, I just want to read a quick announcement. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NOCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone, in the audience and listening at home. We're going to open up the meeting this evening with the <coughs> public comment. If anybody's here for public comment, please go to the podium. I will recognize you and just give you your full name and address. Anyone here for public comment? My name is David Monaghan. I'm a resident of North Reading. I live at 42 Wilson Ave here in North Reading. Um, I'm also a member of the United Steelworkers who are currently locked out by National Grid. Uh, when negotiations broke down uh, at the end of June, they locked us out of our jobs, canceled our health in insurance. Um, they have canceled most of their normal work, um, but as this drags on, we think they're going to go back to doing their normal work. The issue that we're concerned about is the fact that they're using inexperienced, untrained, unfounded workers, so to speak. They've, they're using management people they've put into, um, out into the field with a week of training. They're inexperienced, um, and it's creating a huge public safety concern. We as the union have turned in 25 items to the DPU that are being investigated. Um, these are the people that would be responding to a leak in the home, would be responding to CO in the home. Um, all aspects from that side and construction projects also, they're inexperienced with putting in anything that involves live gas. We've gone to a lot of the neighboring towns and asked for them to put in place a temporary moratorium. Um, while there's no oversight, normally every crew that is installing gas main in the ground on the construction project specifically, there's an experienced person there every step of the way. Uh, the contractors don't do anything with live gas. They put dead pipe in the ground. And we're thinking that the company is going to go back to pressing these people into roles that they're not normally uh, experienced with. And it's creating public safety concerns. I have some pictures of different instances we've observed of them doing things that go directly in the face of their safety protocols, if anybody would care to see them or whatnot. Um, but I'm just here today asking the selectmen to consider a temporary moratorium, not for emergency work. We don't want to put anybody in harm's way. We're trying to avoid that. So obviously an emergency, this wouldn't cover it, but basically any non-emergency work would cease until um, the experienced people are back to work and they can oversee the work that's taking place. Um, Boston proper has implemented a moratorium. Charles, these are just the towns that we cover out of the work locations that I work with. Charlestown has implemented one. East Boston has implemented one. Malden, Medford, Somerville, the city of Lowell, and the city of Haverhill. And we've approached some other towns and we've been going to the local selectmen meeting um, to put this put forth in front of them. Anybody have any questions? I think it's a good idea, you know, and I think it's important that uh, you know the utilities you know, take a, uh, a safe and adequate uh, means in which to respond to the public's needs. And the utilities, in this particular case, you know, because of a, a labor contract uh, dispute, you know, is putting the, uh, the public at risk. I think uh, it wouldn't be a, a bad idea for us to just go on record as uh, providing a moratorium on non-emergency work and uh, send the message, settle the contract. Stole, Missouri. Hi, uh, Michael, I had sent you a, an email I received from this gentleman, and uh, you were gonna check to see what activities were going on. Sure. And we were able to get Sure. So I did receive information um, both from you, Ms. Masseri, as well as from my uh, colleagues in other communities, uh, which prompted me to inquire with the town engineer, uh, John Klipfell, uh, as to any activity going on here in North Reading. Uh, at the time, uh, there was uh, no um, 
major distribution system work ongoing. There were two um, services that were scheduled for a replacement, I believe, that were pending, that were uh, underway, and uh, I'm not aware that there were any issues with them. But uh, at that time, which was about two weeks or so ago, that was the status of National Grid's ongoings here in town. Of course, with any emergency work that might be ongoing day to day. Nobody's trying to step in the way of that. It's just the work that they deem they want to do, but don't have any oversight or experience people to do it. Understand your position. I was concerned with projects. If there's a homeowner that's uh, ready to move in and he can't get the gas, they can't get the gas installed or whatever. I'm just trying to get info as to what would would be blocking going forward with saying. Well, the concern that we're raising is that the people that National Grid is going to send out to install that service would be creating more of a hazard for the time being because these are people that have never done this as far as. You know, there's 60 pounds in the ground here in North Reading. That would kill somebody if it was installed properly and turned on. And we're saying that they don't have the proper personnel to do that um, because nobody that's on the job has any more than a week's experience or a week's worth of training. That I would hate to see something go wrong because they had inexperienced people out there and were left to pick up the pieces. What is the status of the negotiations? Um, they are currently meeting once a week, it sounds like. And the company at the end of each session says that their negotiating point hasn't changed. Mr. Schultz. Thanks for coming in tonight. And I know you're here to try to leverage your negotiation, which I think is fine. <coughs> I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I don't think as a board we should do anything until we hear from them as well. We can't just hear from one side of an argument yep. and pull someone's license. So. I would be hesitant to do anything until we hear from them. Okay. But I think your concerns are certainly. Yeah, we're not looking uh, to well necessarily stop anything that's 100% necessary because that's where the public safety lies. But that's our, our main concern is I have pages here of, of just what we've observed of them doing unsafe practices, not following well, their own protocols. Well, you're also here to try to get a leg up in a negotiation, which I respect and I understand it. But let's be honest, I mean, that's yep. why you're here right now. But I think we should hear from them too. I okay. think it's only fair. So what's the, how does the process work? If they want to do work in town, do they have to go through the town hall, Building. get permits? Building. They do, they get it. In most Building. cases, they're through you, Mr. Chairman. In most cases, uh, utilities such as National Grid is obtaining a street opening permit from the Department of Public Works in order to construct in a public way. The most common instances of that uh, would be for a repair or a gas leak, for example, um, for any routine replacement program that they might have ongoing. Uh, and then, of course, for new construction or replacing of existing uh, water mains for water sir excuse me gas mains for gas service to individual homes see I have no problem with the moratorium I, I would support it but with one big proviso proviso and that is we cannot impact what's going on over at 104 lower road you know, I have to assume at some point they that would have an impact if we did this right uh, or did they already pull the gas over there and I, I, I honestly I don't know whether they've pulled a gas service in uh, into the site there at that location or not I don't know so w if we could maybe get us a little more information on the project especially Pulte and I think we should re revisit this back at our next meeting and then make a decision then which I would fully support as long as we know at least that major project doesn't get impacted because that was well underway before all this happened and you know it's important for the town yep you know we have a schedule that we're going to expect things to be delivered over there, and I just don't want to impact that. But other than that, I could care less about anything else that's going on around town. So I want to support what you're suggesting, but I, yep. I just want to make sure we get confirmation and we meet again in three weeks or so. Yes, sir. Sure. Can we invite Eversource? Because I think they should have an opportunity to be here. If they don't um, show up, that would speak volumes. National Grid. National Grid, I'm sorry. It's okay. If they don't show up, that would speak. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. I, don't know if Michael, I, don't know if that's I emailed all the selectmen, so everybody should have my email. If you had any further questions or wanted any further information provided, I'd be happy to get it to you guys. Okay. Michael. Thank you. Mr. Goldberg. I, I think the suggestion is, is a good one in terms of hearing the different perspectives, um, uh, but I, I don't think it's anybody's intention here to arbitrate between the employer no. and the employees, no. and no. I think we should all be cognizant <coughs> of how that may transpire. Yeah, I'm just more concerned about the projects than just to get confirmation. I don't want to impact 104 Lower Road, and then we can decide after that. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is the selectman reports. I and mean, we have all the new business coming up at the end, but if there's any reports that any other selectman, selectman would like to make. Save it for the wastewater. Just is this Min Pelli? I'm sorry. I, don't, I just wanted to ask, um, make an inquiry on behalf of Amy Lutzkowitz. There's a, there's a uh, date coming up August 7th in the morning where um, she's asked if as many of the selectmen as possible can um, attend. Um, and I think, Mike, you're already, uh, the TA's already attending, mm -hmm. um, meeting with the federal um, officials on the, her grant funding. Mm -hmm. And she, I think she would like to see as many of us as can be here as possible. So I told her I would mention it and see if anyone else besides me could go to that. Um, you don't have to answer right now, but if you're available and you can get her an email, I'll, I can forward her email to you. Where is it here? August 7th. August I'm 7th. I'm assuming it's either going to be here. The police department. Mr. Okay, right, police Right now the location is the police department, and it is at 9 o'clock on Wednesday, on Wednesday, August 8th. That's the same night as the national night out as well. It's the morning after. The morning after, sorry. Yes. Yeah, but that's right. That's the federal partners yes. that are doing the audit. Correct. So it would be really helpful if we had a few board members that could attend. And if we're going to have more than two, we probably should post it. I suggest posting a meeting out of an abundance yeah. of caution. But I think it's, um, you know, it's been invaluable. That money has been very important for the progress that we've made. Uh, Amy's done an outstanding job, and we certainly want to continue forward with that. I'm sorry, I won't be able to be there. I will be away on vacation, but Mrs. Mignopelli is going to champion the effort for us, so thank you. And any other board members that can support it would be great. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, any other <laughs> selectmen's report? I, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, just I want to uh, congratulate Mr. Masseri on his retirement from his paying job. <laughs> He's still full-time with this one, for crying out loud, but uh, at the end of June, he, uh, he finished off an uh, uh, illustrious career, and uh, I hope he's enjoying himself and his newfound freedom, and uh, I'm sure he's enjoying time with his family, and he's had pretty good weather so far. I hope you get out in the boat. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Bob. Congrats, Bob. Well-deserved. Anything else? Okay. We're going to, next thing on the agenda is we're meeting with the auditor this evening to discuss the FY 2017 financials. I'll turn it over to Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with us this evening, our uh, finance director, Liz Rourke, and our uh, auditor, Dick Kingston. Um, as you indicated, this is a review of the audit for fiscal year 2017, which is the year that ended on June 30th of 2017. It was completed the late this winter, early spring, if I recall correctly, and you have in your meeting packets both a copy of the complete audit as well as a management uh, letter, including recommendations and the town's responses to recommendations from last year. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hingston. Hi. <coughs> First, thank you for letting us do the audit again. Um, as usual, please feel free to comment or ask a question anytime. I think that these work much better if, if they're more of a conversation than a presentation, so I don't mind being interrupted and disagree if you like to. Um, some years in our report we identify material weak uh, significant deficiencies or internal control weaknesses and, um, however currently the internal controls over all, all the major uh, cycles of assets and liabilities are, are pretty strong you, the cash the accounts receivable and the debt are all reconciled every month uh, from the accountants general ledger to the supporting data in the, the collector's office or the treasurer's office um, there's also a good segregation of duties. Uh, the, the, the billing is seg segregated from the collecting and is segregated from the, um, so from the report, re recording and reporting. So that's a good sign of strong internal controls also. Um, so this year our management letter is more informative than it is, than it is identifying weaknesses and pointing out recommendations. So hopefully you find it that way. The, the first comment has to do with an investment policy. The treasurer often has a significant amount of money to invest. Um, generally, that comes after tax times or after um, you get new state aid or after you sell a big piece of town-owned land. So, <laughs> although somewhat limited by, stat by statute, the treasurer still must uh, uh, weigh risk versus yield on, on, on investment. 
So the, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insures the first $250,000 of money ins deposited in, in their depository. There's also um, some, other depo some, other, some depositories have the Deposit Insurance Fund of Massachusetts, which fully insures all your deposits. So that, that takes care of the risk part, but it generally doesn't help with the yield. So every, usually the less risk you have, the, more, the less, less yield. For example, if you, some investments you uh, put into a bank and they collateralize them. That means that they, they pledge assets, some, some bonds or some securities, government securities, they pledge that against them. But there's a cost to that in interest rate. So usually when you collateralize, it'll cost you a, a half a percent on interest rate. So what that means is, is that the treasurer feels safe, that they're, they're fully insured, but it might cost you a teacher or an employee because a half a percent on a $20 million over the course of the year is, is about $100,000. So uh, that one of the, I think that's important for you guys to develop, particularly now with this money that you're going to have that's going to be around for a long time, to develop an, uh, an investment policy and, and, and determine your risk tolerance. I, I, the treasurer is, is, is the one responsible for investing the money, but I just think when there's this kind of money floating around, most of, in the past it's been short-term investments. It, they, got, they got money quarterly or they got your, your quarterly tax payments, quarterly state aid, but it wasn't invested long-term, so they didn't have to consider where to invest it. It just was short-term investments and, and, and out the door pretty quick. Whereas this money's going to be around for a, a period of time, I think that the treasurer shouldn't be left on an island on, on what to do with this money. I think that it's, it's, it's enough money that the board should, should be involved. There, there's a, a bank report that comes out quarterly. It's called the Vera Bank Report, and it rates all the ba Massachusetts banks based on a number of financial factors on their strength. And um, it, like blue four star is the strongest, and it goes down to green and number of stars and then yellow. So I think the policy should include reviewing, I think that Marianne does look at that right now, but I think the policy should include <coughs> what to do when a uh, bank dips below a certain, what you determine to be a, an acceptable level. So that if it does fall out of the blue category into the green category, you move the money. I, th I think that the, there's a couple of things that, that, the, that can happen to the treasurer. The worst thing that can happen in the treasurer's office is somebody steals money. The second worst is a bank fails. Um, but I think that there's two parts of that. The bank failed, and, and what the public perceives is what you did to, to avoid that. And if you, if you have a policy that's in place that says we're only going to stay in banks that are above blue three star, blue, whatever you determine, then if it does go below that, you move the money. Well, if the bank does fail, you still lose the money, but at least you've done your due diligence and, you, and you, your fiduciary responsibility. The website for that Vera Bank report also shows what, within each category, how many banks have failed over, over, the hist over history. And, and clearly, the, the higher the, the bank rating, the less times that happens. And so the blue four star, almost never. You know, it gets down to the, the, the yellow, still not a lot, but you know, there's a risk. So I think that that should be part of your investment uh, policy. There's a, there's a, the, the Treasurer's Association has on its website a template investment policy. And, and I think it's a really good starting point. But I think it's, it's more tailored for just general investments. It's not tailored so much for um, when you have a significant amount of money like, like this to, that's going to be around for a while. So, but I think it's a good place to start. So I guess my recommendation is that the town finance team, along with your, with, with your input, develop um, a, um, an investment policy on, on how risk tolerant you guys are with that money. Um, I, I think it's something that should be an ongoing document because just because you decided that I, I have this certain risk tolerance this year, the board may change, the times may change. I think it's something that should be looked at every couple of years and say, do we still have that same risk tolerance? I know when, when, when you guys first, when the town first invested in its trust funds with an investment uh, agency, it was in a very conservative um, model. What they, they do is they come out and they say, you know, how much do you want? I mean, they ask you your risk tolerance. You sign something, 
and the lower your risk tolerance, the lower you, obviously your risk, but also the yield. So, but at the time, the people had a very low risk tolerance, and, and even when I had places that had lost a significant amount of money, and, and the town had lost very little, they weren't happy with that loss at the time because it was public money. But like like you know, the other ones went back up, and so they're 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 more ahead now. But it's it's all personal you know, preference on, on where your risk tolerance is, particularly when it's public money. So that's the first comment. I think that's uh, something that the town should look at. Look at. Um, the next comment has to do with the implementation of new standards. Uh, so in an effort to enhance the financial information in, in the financial statements that we prepare, the governmental accounting standards board is continually issuing new standards. Um, so recently they uh, implemented or they released GASB statement number 74 and 75, which relate to your OPEB trust and your OPEB, li trust, OPEB liability. Um, right now we're in between years. GASB 74 was implemented in, in, in 17 and 18 is implemented and GASB 75 is 18. So it causes some confusion if somebody really starts to look at the financial statements. Because if you look at one page, the financial statements themselves are still under the old category, uh, the old standards. And they, if you look in there, they show a net OPEP obligation of $36 million. Now that's because under the old standards, your, op your total liability was being phased in over a 30-year period. Now the net OPEP liability that's shown in the back of the report is $63 million. So those are, it's two places you'd look at them and say, what, why two numbers and what, but it's, it's a net OPEB obligation, it's the key word is obligation, and then the total, the net OPEB liability. So, so next year, the financial statements, they'll both go with the net OPEB liability, the bigger number. So you're gonna have a much bigger number in your financial statements, which will bring down your unrestricted fund balance uh, next year, along with everybody else that, that has that same thing. One, the other thing that, that I think is important is that the new standard made specific requirements on what you could use for the discount rate when you were, uh, for your, when you're calculating the net OPEB liability. So under the old standards, they just, it was a little more wishy-washy. And they used a 4.4% discount rate. Under the new standards, unless you are, and the term is significantly funded, then, then you have to use the municipal bond rate. And the municipal bond rate was 3.58% for June 30th, 17. So there's a couple things about that. One, like the, when they're using a discount rate, they use 4.4, it's typically used, they use a similar one year after year. The municipal bond rate can fluctuate. In, uh, so from June 30th of 17, it was 3.58. In, in June 30th of 16, it was about a percent lower. And just to show you, I don't know if everybody has the financial statements, but just to show you the, what the magnitude of 1% can mean is on page 58 of the financial statements, the discount rate for your the net OPEB liability using the 3.58% is $63 million. On, if, if, I like to look at the bright side, but so if you had been more significantly funded and, or, and they could use a higher discount rate, then the liability would have been $13 million less. So it would have gone to our, our $11 million less. So it would have been you know, uh, much better. There's also, so that's the magnitude of that 1% that you're not being able to use the 4.4, 3.58. There's also uh, a, a, another assumption that's the, what, what your health care trend rates are gonna change. And that, they, they based it on, in their assumptions was 8% down to 5%. You know, 8% down to 6%, 7% down, 6 down to 5%. And so, if you did 1% better and it went from 7%, if they used the different assumptions and it went down to 4%, then your liability would have been about $12 million better. So just those two assumptions, 1% swing either way, means a $23 million swing in what your 
liability would have been. So the more significant funding that you can put into your OPEP trust, the better off you'll be. I actually tried to call the, the person who did the actuary, the, that did the actuarial study for you today, to find out what, what the dollar amount would have to be for her to say that you are significantly funding. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't get a hold of her. I, sh I probably should have tried it before, but I, to be honest, I didn't think of that until just, um, just today. But it would have to be a consistent amount over, an, over a number of years that's, that they're looking for to be. If you, it, the, the, the pension system has a funding policy, and it's a statutorily required funding policy. They are statutorily required to assess their members. You guys can have a funding policy, but it's not, it's not a legal policy. Another board could come in and change it, or you guys could say, that's too much. We don't want to do that same amount. So one of the things they, they said is that, in the standard, is if you have an a internal policy and that you've been following that policy for three to five years that, uh, of, of significant funding, that they can call that a formal policy or treat it like it's a legal policy because you've demonstrated that you're going to do that. So I just wanted to kind of explain in, the, in here, if somebody started looking at these financial statements and saying hey, there's, there's the same number being told me it's two different things, it's true, we, we, we are, but it's the standards that have just like not caught up with it, so. Um, the, rest, the rest of the management letter is, is just um, the status of the prior year finding. And we like to put this in because it shows you that, that it's, and, and the people, the other readers, that you take the financial uh, management letter comments uh, seriously because almost all the time they, they get implemented. So the first one was procurement, procurement rules for federal grants. They had changed recently, and the, the federal government wanted you to have like certain uh, internal control documents over these. And um, the, most of your federal grants relate to the schools. And Mike at the school did a nice job and created a nice document that included all the federal requirements, which recently went up to uh, $10,000 in the So, so uh, almost usually when I when I'm putting in here, not everywhere I go, but when I put in the current status, usually they've been implemented, and, and that's the case here. There were some uh, issues with the ambulance receivables. Some of there were some old receivables that need to be written off. Um, as a as a date, this was back in May. They said that a policy was being written, and that it was going to be implemented in 2019. Is that still the plan for that? Yes. I mean, I can speak to it a little more, but we. Um, we're Oops, sorry. Uh, last year when we met around this time, um, we talked about the ambulance receivables and we talked about how we would put a plan in place to take <coughs> care of the uncollectibles that have been on the books for quite some time. Um, the fire chief uh, working with Comstar, our ambulance billing um, uh, company, um, we <laughs> they, they sent out delinquent letters to all of those past due accounts and we collected a whole $300. Um, so anything that is older than <coughs> three years old is going to be written off. Um, the public safety director, the uh, fire chief, myself, and the town administrator have worked um, and had several meetings on the ambulance uncollectibles. So we are you know, definitely tackling it and we are putting a policy in place to take care of it as we now know that you know, even with Comstar doing their due diligence and sending out letters, the the collection rate for those um, old accounts just is not realistic. The, um, the, the ambulance receivables are some of the hardest monies to collect because there's really no teeth in it. I mean, if somebody doesn't live in town, there's, noth there's nothing you can do because except send out more letters. And, and um, if they do live in town, it's not like a real estate that you can lean or a motor vehicle that you can notify the registry and, and like not let them get their next license into it. It's just there's really no teeth <coughs> to it. So um, I, I think that the policy, in my opinion, what, what I've recommended in the past is that the policy be that, that Mike or someone in that position gets, has the authority to, to um, to write off the old ones after the, after the steps have been followed. 
and that they inform you of, the, of it so that I don't think it's something that you should have to look at and vote on publicly. I think it's something that, but whatever that he's doing, I think he should put it in your packet so that you would know that that's what we're doing. And just in case there's somebody that, that you say on the, hey, wait a minute, this is somebody I don't maybe want to take another look at before you write it off. So that's my personal opinion on that. How much was it the total? Um, do you remember? I, I, we can get you that information. Yeah. I had it at one point. Yes. Um, I don't know if it was within five years um, because the current town administrator has not written off any. Um, so it may have been six years, and so they're now the collections are six years old. We can get that information. So. Mrs. Minupelli. Is that, don't we abate them though? You you tend to, ha we've done that annually, right, on sure. some of the ones that we know aren't collectible. Not, Is that not a for different rent collectibles. Policy, if or? somebody. Oh, you <laughs> Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. I threw you, Mr. Chairman. So um, when we were, when somebody contacts us and indicates that they cannot pay the bill, um, we take that very seriously. It's a re That is a request for an abatement. We send them a form. Um, there's a minimum criteria that they need to meet um, for income levels. When they demonstrate that, we bring it to the board and ask the board to act on it. And I want to say we've done that maybe three times in my time here since 2014. We probably received twice that in requests, so maybe six people or so, maybe maybe ten. Say I can, maybe I'm being a little too low on the number, but say ten people have contacted us. Um, and in those cases, they're not eligible for an abatement because of those ten, the other, the, the, the seven that didn't make it to the board just didn't meet the minimum criteria for receiving an abatement for the bill. Um, the rest, these are all individuals who have not contacted us at all. Um, they've not said, stop sending me a bill because I can't afford it, I'd like an abatement. They're just not responding at all. In oh, most so cases. We don't have a policy to let you clear the debt off the book if it's... I, I think it's, there isn't, there hasn't been a clear policy about those that are not that are being um, written off, so to speak, and that's why I've been apprehensive. Um, I think that our co our performance is very good. Our collection rate exceeds the uh, average according to what we receive from Comstar, so it isn't as if we have any sort of a problem going on. Um, but it is one of those things where you know there's a service that was provided, a bill that was sent, and it wasn't paid. And uh, we don't write off tax bills. Uh, and uh, granted, this is for something different. Um, so I think it was more just trying to make sure there was a transparent process by which we followed the, the writing off rather than mm -hmm. just it being a signature and that's the end of it. And so uh, we're working towards that. Um, again, reissuing billing. Um, we got $300, um, which is you know great, but not a whole lot for the effort. And we've been candidly advised by Comstar that it's not really worth our while to pursue these things further because our collection rate is so high. Mr. Schultz. Are we filing 1099Cs for forgiveness of debt with people who will be writing off? We'd have to refer to Comstar for that piece. We we don't hold that information, so. Okay. If people start paying taxes on the money we're writing off, they might pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes you can't find tax. the person. You know, I, I've been told yeah. that yeah. sometimes the they they don't give their right address when they get into the ambulance. I've been told in in, in other places who have, have dealt with this. This is this is not an uncommon problem. It's a it's, a, it's one of the harder bills to collect. Cheaper to pay the tax than to pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> and that could, you know, yeah. you know, get some satisfaction out of it. <laughs> well, sell sell the old debt to a company, a collection company that can do, go after it on its own, and we get a little chunk of change and write it off in that manner. Please continue. Okay. The next comment was to uh, unclaimed checks. There was an old outstanding check related to the Eisenhower property that that got closed out, and I think it helped get free cash by about thirty-two five. That was implemented in. And then we have comments about capital assets, and that was implemented. Um, so did the, the 32, did we disperse it? No, it, it was, no, it was, it, what it was, was it, it was, the, back in the time, you probably remember, they wrote the checks to people, and then the people ap appealed it, brought it to court. So then when they, when the court, the we, so they wrote another check you, for okay. it. Yep, yeah. so they wrote the other check for it. Everybody had gotten their checks, but this one, that the person had just not cashed, because they actually brought it back at the time. Um, so that's it on the management letter. 
Um, I'll just real quickly with the financial statements. Um, the, the, the opinion letter is clean in the front says that the, what, that's the first thing that the readers look at. Moody's, they'll say um, they want to look at the opinion that says the, the financial statements daily present. After that, the rest of it's boilerplate. So they, they see that paragraph, that they're, they're happy. Um, there's two reports in the back one on internal control and compliance with laws and regulations, one just on the town uh, and one on the town's federal grant. And both of those are clean. There are no deficiencies or compliance issues. And, and the one financial statement, if you don't mind, uh, just take a quick look at, is on page 64. This is your budget versus actual. So it shows what your original budget was, your final budget amount, and, and the budget amount and the actual amounts received and the variance. Um, the, the column to the far right, if you look at the total, your, your, your revenues came in to the good uh, over the budget by about $814,000. And your expenditures came into the good, 651000 This is what generates your free cash. So conservative revenue estimates um, and, 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 and closing out appropriations is, is what, what generated your free cash this year. So, and, and I think both of those are good. I mean, that's, that's how I think you should. You should be conservative and you don't give out too much money at the beginning of the year because you, 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 vote to, you use some of your free cash for for capital-related items, and, and then you replenish it by being um, conservative in your estimates and, and not just spending the money because, you, because it's left in your budget. So that's indicative that you, you did both. So I'm happy to answer any other questions, or, or if anybody wanted to sit down and go page by page, I'd be happy to do that. Then so the only thing that I wanted to chat about quickly is yep. you know every year I kind of a little bit all over Liz and Michael about our bond rating yep. the ability to make what do we have to do <coughs> to get a better bond rating and I just well, I thought maybe we could have yeah. a quick conversation about that and any suggestions yep. in areas that we would suggest we can do a little bit better on to get the next level of bond rating. Yep. Well let's give me a little heads up on that so so one of the things there's, there's a couple of things one of the things that Moody's does they have like hot button issues. And right now, fund balance policies is, is one of the things. Consistently applied fund balance policies. So by that, what they, what they mean is they, they want a policy. But one of the, it's kind of like a, a tough thing because you like, most boards like flexibility. And, and Moody's doesn't. They like policies that says that um, Minim, our, our, our minimum fund balance policy is that we're going to have 7% you know, of our um, ex general fund expenditures is going to be reserved, and we're not going to go below that. We're, even, you know, we're not going to let our free cash go below that, and that means not appropriating it. Um, so they, one of the things they look at is your unassigned fund balance, and that your know, general fund uh, free cash, your unreserved fund balance, and your stabilization fund. And what they, what they do is they add the two of those together. Oh, they look at our financial statements, and that's what we do. And, and they, they apply, they do a percentage of your general fund expenditures. So this year, it was about 6.53%. That's what your unassigned fund balance was re relative to your general fund expenditures. So I have like a couple AAA communities and they're more up in the 12 to 15 percent range on that, and I think uh, 10 to 12 is a, is a is a is a is a goal, a good goal. I mean, because it, it's it's not easy. It's not easy to do that. The other thing that they like to see in your fund balance policy is like, is what are you doing with it when free cash gets certified? That that you ha that your fund balance policy says 30 percent is going to the stabilization fund, 30 percent is going to a capital stabilization fund. 10% uh, is going to an OPEB, and the, ba the rest you can do what you want with, or, or that we use for budget purposes. And, and that's not to say that you can't use the stabilization fund, because it's almost like sometimes it just makes it a two-step process. But they do like to see reserves grow. You know? So there, there's, there's, for Moody's and Standard & Poor's, there isn't too much of reserves, you know, and, and so there's that what you have to weigh is how much reserves 
do we want to have versus how much do we want to tax versus how much do we want to be able to appropriate. So, uh, yeah. Is there, are you familiar with a, a sort of formula or a percentage of what they look to, to for, you know, a percentage of our annual, you know, they look at they general budget to yeah, be Yeah, that's aside. what they look at. They look at your percentages of, of your unassigned fund balance versus your general fund expenditures. And right now it was about 6.5%. And I think that they'd like it to be over 10, 10 to 12. That's what they, I mean, it's not bad okay. now. Okay. It's just if you're looking for an upgrade, yeah. these, are, these are the places that you probably have to, good, to get. Um, the, the, other, the other thing is, although I don't think that they're um, – downgrading anybody because of the OPEB uh, liability, I think that it, it's hard to move up without doing something something to fund the, the, the OPEB liability. Which we are. Yeah. You yeah. see what we're doing, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But mean, is all the communities doing more? About well, you know, yes, yes and yes. There's more and less. There's, there, everybody's doing, you know, the, the people, the, the certain towns that have a lot you know, this, this, some of the wealthier towns are doing a lot more. A lot, you know what, the, the towns that really do the best are the towns that are fully regionalized because they don't have the school system part of it. So they have a lot smaller entities. Damn schools. <laughs> well, it's not the schools, but because, I mean, sometimes I, I say to those towns that, that, that have, are really well funded, I say, well, what if your regional school wanted to do likewise? And they say, oh, well, we couldn't do that. <laughs> because it's, but, but the, the ones that are most funded are the ones that the regional schools are not funded because they wouldn't pay the regional schools to, to fund. So some are doing more and, and, and some are doing less. Some are doing nothing. But I, th I think like if you could get to the point where, where your actuary is saying that, okay, you're meeting the requirement of significantly funding then that would, just by its very nature, let, I'll make your liability go down potentially 13 to $15 million, and which will make your financial position look better. So it's all like sometimes, sometimes like doing that uh, and funding your OPEB can, if, if you're doing a significant borrowing, I mean, then, then it can help reduce your borrowing amount. And, and if you put money into OPEB, it might even be better than putting money into stabilization. You can't use it, but it might help get you a $13 million better balance sheet. So I, I think that fund balance policies and, 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 and reserves are probably the... And the last question I had was yeah. um, the significant funding for OPEB. We are going to get that definition at some point. Yeah, I would, I would say, you know... Okay, yeah. Because I have a definition. What, what you <laughs> I'd rather not say oh. publicly. So. A lot? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Well, thank you. Very detailed report as every year. Thank you. Much appreciated. And Liz, this really is a reflection upon you. As you've heard us say before, we can never thank you enough from your team. I know it's uh, a team effort. So, um, and we know the town administrator has very little to do with it, so credit really does belong over <laughs> here. <laughs> no, but thank you as well, Michael. And well, I, I, do, I will want to agree with you that you're lucky. You know, really well, good yeah, job to the town. and the town should be yeah. happy to hear this report. Yes. You know, the townspeople probably just breeze past this, and, you know, it's one of those things when it ain't broken, no one's really thinking about it. That's right. And this isn't broken, which is a great thing. Yeah. And uh, we're going to continue to be strong financially and we are trying to look for advantages. And yeah, you should. And then we well, can do it. And I like the idea of policies. I, I'm a fan yeah. of them. And if we can put some in place that makes us stronger and be able to borrow at a less rate, I'm yeah. all for it. Because in the end, bigger picture, long-term perspective, we're going to save money for our taxpayers. Well, I have a couple towns that I could ask to send you, you know, their policies. And, and that would uh, be great. If you want to talk, talk to Liz. I'd rather not reinvent the wheel. That would be good. Okay. Well, even the ones that have policies, don't like it sometimes, yep. you know, like even the board members when it comes to th what, what they have, something they want to spend it for, um, and, and the, the finance director says, I'm sorry, if you want to do it, you, I'm not saying you can't do it, but first it's going to the stabilization fund, first it's going here, and, then, and like some have like debt stabilization funds, so, yeah, I'm sure you've got plenty to do tonight. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Bye.
Okay, next on the agenda are the minutes for June 18th, 2018, regular and executive session. Mr. Mr. O'Leary. I move to approve the July 18th, 2018, regular session minutes, Ezra, is it July? Second. I got a July second by minute. Oops, sorry. June 18th. June. 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 Does it say July in the motion? Say July, yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah, we'll think we were here. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Chairman. And this is June again. June. I move to approve the June 18, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. A motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Next, appointments, reappointments, election workers. Mrs. Statz. Good evening. Good evening. Once again, this is our annual visit for yes. appointing the election workers under the statutes. Um, so the uh, election workers are uh, come to us uh, from either the Democratic and or the Republican town committees on their recommendations and unenrolled election workers just through the Board of Registrars themselves through the town clerk's office. And the process is that um, the registrars will meet and go over the names and make their recommendation to this board on an annual basis. And the board has one of three options. One is to just appoint election workers for each position on their own. The other is to follow the recommendations of the Board of Registrars. And the third is just to take no action at all, in which case the appointment process <coughs> reverts just to the town clerk by August 15th. So historically in the past, you've chosen option two, which is to follow the recommendation of the Board of Registrars. And um, I'm looking for uh, a like decision today. Um, we have a list of about 75 election workers who are very diligent and eager to start into the fall election season already. Um, they are all very dedicated and um, willing participants and I can't speak uh, more highly about them and, and regard them more highly than I do because they're truly dedicated persons. Uh, whether they're veteran election workers or new ones that come to us, they really look forward to it. They do their jobs, they go to come to the trainings, and they're very diligent and cooperative, and they get along with one another very well. So. Great. That's what we if have. Any questions from the board? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to exercise the following option for appointment of election workers for elections held between September 1st, 2018 through August 31st, 2019 point election officers from the list submitted by the registrars as recommended by the registrars. Second. I have a motion. I have a second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank Thanks for coming in this evening. Mr. Masseri. Mr. Masseri. She just, just wanted to congratulate you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Next, introduce the new DPW director, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, pleased to introduce our new director of public works, Mr. Patrick Bauer, who is here this evening. He is joined by Human Resources Director Bob Collins, who facilitated the uh, interview process for the position uh, over the past uh, four or five months now at this point, six months. Um, a little bit about Mr. Bauer. Uh, he comes to us from the city of Methuen, where he served as DPW director since 2014. Mr. Bauer also served as DPW director and town engineer in Raymond, New Hampshire from 2010 to 2014. He was also briefly the interim town manager in Raymond as well. Prior to his experience as a DPW director, Mr. Bauer worked for seven years as a project uh, engineering and construction supervisor in the private sector. Mr. Barr uh, also served as an assistant town engineer in the town of Winchester from 1996 to 2001. Um, he is a licensed professional engineer in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, I provided the board a complete copy of his resume as well. And we welcome Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
through you, Mr. Chairman, a little bit about the process. So sure. we did advertise uh, twice for the position, once uh, back in January and then again uh, in roughly April, I believe. Um, when, and uh, we saw a very strong field um, come uh, forward with 24 candidates. There were, if you combine the two processes uh, through the chair, we had a, a total of 36 applicants. Uh, we conducted a series of interviews, 18 in total, and uh, narrowed it down. The, the first group was in February. We did uh, interview five out of the 12 that applied. We went back out and then uh, got another 24 candidates, of which we interviewed seven. Narrowed that down to three, then to two, then to one. So it was a, it was, it was a we looked at it as an investment process to get the, the best candidate, and we were very fortunate to get him. So Mr. Bauer's first day is today, so welcome. Uh, he'll attend his first department head meeting on Wednesday morning. Um, was out around town today and will be down at the garage tomorrow morning, I believe. That's correct. Uh, we're pleased to have him on board um, and pleased to have him here this evening. Uh, he's going to stay because there's some other DPW items on the agenda as well, so there's more work to be done this evening. Um, and we welcome him, uh, but also, uh, again, and I know I've said it before, I want to recognize Mark Clark, our water superintendent, um, who served as acting director um, during a very challenging time with all of the work going on relative to the water project. Um, Mark, um, I'd ask you to stand up. I just want to give you a round of applause. Thanks again. <laughs> Mr. Clark. As, uh, as Mark is approaching, uh, Mark is an example of uh, the strong DPW that we have um, today uh, with himself as a water superintendent, with uh, Julie as the building superintendent, with Chris Deming as the operations manager, and uh, with John Clipfell, who's also here this evening uh, as a town engineer. We have a great team, and Patrick, uh, you'll have a tremendous amount of support. And Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Yeah, I, I just want to basically echo what Mike said. Uh, it, it's been a kind of an interesting five or six months for me. Um, <laughs> spent more time with some of you guys than I did with my wife. So I just wanted to thank, I wanted to thank everybody on the board. Um, I'll just share this. The, uh, the final bill for FY18 from Andover came in today, and we were within three cents in, in my calculations and theirs for the credit that, that we received. And the credit was almost $375,000 for FY18. So and that was three cents which way? Uh, they, actually, they actually calculated it higher. So, so I kind of trust it's correct at this point. Um, so we agreed to write off that three cents and agree that their amount was correct. But uh, I just wanted to thank you guys. You guys were instrumental in, in getting that done. The push that was, you know, the push at the local level and then at the state level to get that done was just, was just huge. So I want to thank everyone for that. That was a good, uh, good accomplishment, I think, during that time. Um, but I did want to thank all the department heads. I know Liz is here and some of the other department heads. Barbara. Uh, I deliberately would like brush my hair out every morning when I came in so people <laughs> think I was ready to explode and then people would be like very nice to me all day. So, <laughs> that, that, that worked well. But I especially do. I want to recognize the DPW staff as well. Um, they've stepped up to the plate. As you guys know, we went through some rather huge incidents a couple years ago. Uh, but the staff we have right now has just been incredible in this, the, in this whole thing for me. I want to recognize um, you know, Jackie and Diane, the two executive assistants up here in Town Hall, obviously Julie, the building superintendent, uh, John stepped in, he's kind of come in, we've got a couple projects that have actually been completed, you've seen the, the Haverhill Street sidewalk, um, we've done the, the milling and paving on Patriot Way and Freedom and Liberty and Eagle, and those are a good credit to him, um, just recognize them. I, I just also want to recognize, uh, especially Chris Deming, um, as some of you know, Chris was a union member. He stepped out of the union about the time Andrew left town, became the operations manager down at the garage. And without Chris's uh, assistance, it would have been a nightmare for me. He's just a real solid guy. So I just want to recognize him. And just, I just say thank you to everybody for the, uh, the help everyone's done during this whole process. And I just want to, to, to basically wish Patrick the best. I don't think there's anybody in this room that wants him to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Mr. Masseri. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Masseri. We worked hard on the water contract, and it wouldn't have happened if Mark wasn't part of the team. No doubt. I mean, he spent countless hours convincing the folks in Andover that it was the right thing to do, and then sitting in those long negotiations sessions, never missing one. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mark, thank you, for all your efforts. Mr. Uh, truly, it was Mark's credibility, not ours. 
that got this deal done. Uh, it, it meant a lot for the people up there, but for us, our credibility, he was our face, and that was that was key. But in addition to that, I hope he takes a vacation for him. <laughs> I, I don't think he's had any time off in the last <laughs> six or seven months or more, yeah. and uh, he's earned it. Anybody else? Just a, a quick comment to thank uh, Maureen Stevens and Liz Rourke for assisting in the screening process uh, with Mr. Collins, uh, and then uh, also Chief Murphy, who participated at the end as well. Um, it was invaluable to have your, uh, your opinions and uh, your perspective and to kind of give Patrick a sense of what was going on, give all the candidates a sense of where, where we're at. Um, I found it very valuable, so thank you. So I had the opportunity to meet Patrick this afternoon, and you know, I, I shared with him a few things, and I'll share them again tonight for the public record. You know, he's coming on board at the perfect time. You know, we're getting the water in place, and actually, during that whole process that they, they all went through, Mr. Masseri, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Clark, and his team, we were fortunate enough to now finally have the discussion about wastewater. And, you know, there was a plan in our, as we're going down the DEIR path, in the FEIR about separating the wastewater from the water and now today we're on a path to keep them together. Mm -hmm. So our future is really, really amazing. And so we're gonna be turning this over to you to help us take it to that next level. And we've put in place, I think the infrastructure, we've given Michael the financials, the authority, everything he needs to build the team to take us now to the next level. Mm -hmm. you, you have a great DPW team. and. You know, when you take an individual that's willing to leave the union and move into a leadership role, it tells you about something about the community you're coming to. And it's uh, unheard of, so you're in a great place to succeed. We have nowhere else to go but forward, and I'm looking forward to you being at the helm, welcoming you to the community, and we have a policy here. We never, never suffer in silence. If you need something, you gotta tell us. Mm -hmm. You know, we will work with you. Uh, you know, We've had our challenges in the past years, but this board has got a great willingness to work with all the departments. Do we say yes all the time? No. But we're willing to at least come up with a solution that we're all equally unhappy sometimes, and sometimes we can even find a solution to make you really happy. So welcome. Whatever you need, we're here for you. You've got a great management team around you. I would say you rely on them. Ask lots of questions. And Michael did lie to you. You don't have to wear a suit to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> Just messing with you right now. And, uh, but welcome on board, and Thank we look forward much. to working with you. Thank you. Uh, we still have a few minutes before the 7.30 time frame, so I'd like to move something out of order, if we could, and maybe move to the town administrators uh, taking a vote to approve his, uh, his review. You know, we did the review, but we never took a, a, a motion. We never took a motion to approve it. So to, if we could, Mr. O'Leary, I believe you may have one. Yep. And, but before we do that, just to kind of reiterate, for the folks listening at home, you know, several weeks ago, I believe the date was uh, June 18th, we gave the uh, review of the town administrator. And his overall result, his overall rating was 222.51 out of, from 51, meaning the lowest, to 230, which is outstanding. And he achieved 222.51, which is outstanding, and it's well-deserved. And you know, we did spend a lot of time the evening when we went through it, but I want to reiterate it again. We're very fortunate to have a town administrator like Michael, and we want to go and approve this review officially tonight. And you know, I know you're going to continue forward to do great things and continue to do outstanding in your uh, performance going forward. So, Mr. O'Leary, if no one else has anything said, I'll take a motion. Good. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the 2018 Town Administrator Evaluation and authorize the Chairman to sign the evaluation. Second. I have a motion, a second by Mr. Menupelli. Any discussion? Just a quick comment. Yes, sir, please. Uh, we're lucky to have you, Michael. I just want to make sure we state that for the record. Thank you. And you should probably take a vacation, too, because we know during your vacation you didn't have much of a vacation, right? So well, he lost his hair. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not Clearly he needs it. Work, yeah. Mr. Masseri. Michael's been with us for four years, and I think if we look back at the progress we have made as a team with his leadership uh, for the past four years, we know we have a great man mm. as town administrator. And I thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you for the time we spent together working on some of these issues. Sure. You know, as going back over our strategic plan today, 
and I was looking at the progress assessment, you know, and you look at from the time Michael started here until where we are now and how many things we actually accomplished over his four-year tenure here, it's pretty amazing. And it's truly by his leadership and, and a reflection upon his staff and his department heads and their staff. So uh, I know we have a lot more ahead of us and I know we're going to continue on that same path. So, Mr. O'Leary. I already made it. You voted it. It was unanimous. Yes. We did. We did. Good. Well done. Yes. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to say something. I'm sorry. I saw your hand up there. Okay. So, I think we're at the 730 hour. We are going to discuss. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity this, to need this evening to inform the public and our recreation folks. Um, you know. Couple, was it a couple of years ago we met Mrs. Uh, with Lieutenant Governor, Will, was it a year ago? Last year. last year. And in Representative Jones, and we've been up to the State House a few times, and we presented a few things on our strategic plan. And one of them was we talked about this, you know, we're looking for a community center, mm -hmm. an intergenerational community center. And she was very interested in it. And she said there could be some potential opportunity coming down the road. She said she would work with Brad. And, you know, they did, and they actually did work together. And I know as a board, we really haven't talked a lot about this. It was in our strategic plan, as I stated, uh, but we haven't put a ton of time into it. I worked with Danielle, looked at submitting some stuff to, ba to Brad to see the funding opportunities that are out there, any grant opportunities to help us fund this. And so things have been kind of working behind the scenes. And fortunately, a few weeks ago, we got noticed that there was a House Bill 4549 um, that's provided to, uh, that's for actually capital facility repairs and improvements throughout the Commonwealth. And it got approved. It got signed into law by Governor Baker. And you can, the bill contains $3.8 billion in statewide money. And in there is a little slot for North Reading, for $10 million potentially for an intergenerational community center. It's not a guarantee that we're going to get it, but you know, we could see it on the horizon. And so I wanted to bring it up this evening to talk about it briefly. I'm glad Maureen's here. I you know you have a presentation uh, you wanted to give because we have some work that we have to do to go to the next phase. And I'll say this before you get into it is I had spoken with Representative Jones a few times on this. And, you know, the next, what, what happens next for us, it, it, I think we have a lot of the work done. And he's still in um, session. They got about another eight, nine days of session, and after that, they're going to take a little break, and then we're going to engage him with the information that you hopefully you'll share with us tonight, and we and we'll discuss more about what investments as a town we may have to make to get this ten million dollars. So I'm going to turn it over to Maureen. Okay. Well, this all started way back, um, and the team right here um, did a lot of the investigative and um, what we need and it started out as a wish we have small facilities we need bigger facilities and one of the reasons is this is our facility here at uh, 5 Central Street and we use the gym here but this is basically the only two areas we have and Lynn like on a given day today she's uh, got a oh, hundred children down at the batch at the playground program we would love to be able to house them here at the park uh, it saves us money and it's also inclusive of everything we want to do with our younger kid program and what have you. So this facility has three program rooms and they're about the size of a small ranch, which is a, we call one a tumble room, a kitchen with a little open area and we call it the blue room. Uh, fenced in outdoor area, small, upstairs storage, breezeway garage storage area. It's air conditioned, that's a plus. So that's where we run a lot of our programs, but it doesn't house more than 30 children at a given time, and even that's a little tight. That's the backyard. Marian, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just for the, for the board members, um, there is a copy uploaded in the meeting packet this evening if you want to follow along on your iPad as well. Sorry, thank you. No problem. So that's the backyard. That's our kid connection that we do right now in the summer. That's for mm, potty train through about uh, age five that Lynn has a uh, director doing that. So there's uh, the inside in the blue room, which a lot of the artwork was done by Lynn Clemens and her staff and some of the children. So <laughs> well, it's, it's really uh, very, uh, and it, you know, and it brings a lot of energy. So basically this is a wish list and I'm not gonna read it through, but basically we would want a full-size gym with a walking track of some sort suspended above the gym 
um, locker rooms, reception areas, studio rooms that you can do dancing and fencing and you know karate, uh, multi-purpose rooms, you know sinks and storages, um, all kinds of multi-purpose rooms, bathroom facilities, and um, teen centers and separate offices for us. And that was our wish list back in '13. Um, and it hasn't changed much. It's been upgraded. So not to read it all, that's basically what that says. And the uses of a community center are pretty much just as I say, summer camps, youth services, hold meetings, um, have the offices in there, recreation, youth services, senior, um, veterans, the whole bit, rental opportunities, the gyms, run community events. That's what all community centers do. So we want, we would like the same. So this is Natick, and Lynn has done um, these field trips and taken pictures and done some research on it. That's Natick Community Senior Center, and the pros are it has a full-size gym um, and some other things, computer rooms, rooms with this, large great room. The cons are she had determined to need a separator, um, what have you. It's uh, no small kitchen area. They only have a commercial kitchen, um, mostly designed for senior use because it is a senior center, it too. It is a senior center that they let recreation use on all the time. Right. It wasn't built in and this is Shirley Center at uh, Beverly YMCA, Teen and Children's Center, same thing. Um, basically the pros and cons follow the same sort. This one has a reception area you couldn't go through um, without showing, a, you know, a m mini lockers, offices, a huge uh, swimming pool. We don't want a swimming pool. Um, the one level, two size courts, on and on. So they basically follow the same suit. This is Wellesley. So Lynn has gone to these facilities and then pros and cons and talk to the staff about what they like and don't like about the facility themselves or what works and doesn't work that um, even with what they have in the facility and what they would probably do differently now that they've had it she's done a lot of research on it so she's taken that research and basically put it into and you'll see it further on into what we would like to have so located at the river park versus main street um, the pros are Fred IRP, it's open space, it's attractive, it has walking fields and access to the IRP barbecues. We can run our summer programs there, it saves us rental fees, the cons of parking. Additional parking is in the plans, but still could be crowded on our busy seasonal days. And we know what that's like when I have a barbecue. So, um, located on Main Street, and higher visibility, possible downtown, uh, parking cons, not on park, no access to fields. And if it was on Main Street, we may have to buy the property no access to community events, possibly not able to run recreation summer programs because they're not accessing to a field. So then it was updated. And in this update, Lynn has involved, uh, got involved with, it was the ACT, right? The ACT. Well, before that, first we met Elder Services, Veterans, Parks and Recreation and Youth Services. That's when we had that meeting with the update. 615. Yes. Yeah. And then the ACT program, which is another group. Right. And, that, uh, and those were the notes for that. So those were some other things that other people would like to see in there um, if we were gonna include the elder services and the veterans and what they would need and what they would like and how that would work. So we have another wish list there that was updated 11, 17, 17. So this is where it becomes intergenerational community center. We had a meeting with uh, Gale Associates um, and mentioned that we would need these things in a future center and these are the things we were looking to have. So this was our, um, we had a feasibility study done in February 4th, 2014, land utilization paid for it out of their gift account. The cost of that was $10,000. Um, that's um, just the contract. And they gave us a layout plans number one, two, and three. I can read there right here, layout number one, community center is located within the same parcel, meaning IRP. There are approximately 198 new parking spaces. A new maintenance shed will be located in the back next to the pump house. You'll see that in the next um, slide. The existing house, the recreation center, will be demolished and the area could be used as septic and stormwater management. So this is the uh, plan they give us um, and it shows where it says Central Street, there's the rec center right where it says Central and they put the facility right there, all parking spaces. Marty's done a drone shot, so you can see there's the recreation center right here, and it would basically, they would want to demolish that, that would be used for leaching and septic, and then it would be built lengthwise down there, demolish the shed, and there's the pump stations way in the back. Does this have a pointer, Mike? It does, yeah. yeah. Is it the green button? Yeah. Okay. There we go. 
Oh, it doesn't work in this one, does it? It will, it will work up there, though. Okay. So basically, the pump house is way back here, but that's, uh, we call this the barn, but that would be demolished, and um, they would build a new facility back here. So that was the plan on that, and that's layout number one. And that's just another drawn shot showing you a little bit better, um, you know, the, the perpendicular, that it would just go right that way. Excuse me, Maureen? Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you while you're going along. Go right ahead, absolutely. When you did that study, was it 2004 or 2014? You flicked it so fast. I didn't oh, know. 17. 14. 14. 14. 2014. This was 2014 oh, that okay. these plans were made. And I think this layout, so where that border is right there, that is the end of our parcel? Oh, the, yeah, the that's Central Street. There's the rec center. Okay. And that's where the buses park. And yeah, there's yeah. the, yeah, uh, and this is now where the, they would want the rec center to the new community center to be parking new maintenance shed and the pump station <coughs> would stay here who owns the parcels two lots to the south do you know is that our land as well mm -hmm. no. 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 no it's privately, privately owned, owned. Right. yeah the one next to the rec center is wheeler right so right. <coughs> please continue So the layout number two is community centers are located along the adjacent parcel, parks parcel. The building shift allows for approximately 270 new parking spaces. A new maintenance shed would be located in the back. Similar to what just happened. The existing house would be demolished, very similar. It needs a new septic, what have you. So what they do is they moved, um, they moved it over here in what's called the meadow, and I'm going to show you that in a drone shot. So instead of having, you got Central Street right there, Rec Center right here, They've moved it over in the meadow. So I'm going to show you a drone shot. And this is all that parking. That's all the grid there. Um, this, this is the drone shot, and this is what they'd want to do with it. They'd put it right in this area. So they just put it adjacent to it. And then they would make all that parking, leaching fields, or what have you, again, demolish that. So it, it's, it would fit into that capability right there. That's just layout number two, more parking. And layout number one and two comments, it just says both of these layouts will require a robust storm water management system due to the amount of proposed impervious uh, parking roof existing high water table. The parking lot at the park next door utilizes infiltration areas use similar, using similar storm water management systems for the new community center may impact the number of parking spaces. We may want to look into making the parking uh, spaces more porous pavement, uh, permeable pavers to help mitigate the storm water runoff. So it's just their suggestion on those two. Um, layout number three um, puts it completely across the meadow. We call it raised meadow. So that's completely across. Instead of this way, it goes this way. And that leaves all of that for parking, um, which gives more spots. There's 210 um, existing spots that go between here, around the gazebo, and the boat launch. So, it, and Maureen, if you can point out on that drawing, there's also parking behind the building. Do you see that? That's right. handicapped parking. parking right there. Yeah. And the road, the driveway kind of goes around the building yeah. for drop off at the front door and then handicapped parking against the back of the building. Is that the greatest of things? And this shows you, again, it's the same drone shot, but it's, it will go this way. It'll basically go across that way. So you won't see. Um, uh, so layout number three, um, but is oriented so that facing Central Street, the layout allows for approximately 44 new spaces behind the community center, which is what Lynn said on the parks parcel, and 198 new on uh, the other parcel, a total of 242, so that's a greater of them all. New parking space and new maintenance shed will also be located next to the irrigation pump house. The existing house rack up front would also be demolished, but could remain, and the area could be used for septic and or leaching stormwater management. So this, this just mentions all the things that they would be able to put in and uh, read ahead number them so that they could show on plan. So basically this was a first floor plan and it just basically goes over having veterans offices and youth services offices and CAFs and uh, classrooms and they were for multi-purpose things that were all listed on that. So it was basically what Lynn and what and um, in the team had decided would be needed to put youth services, veterans, seniors in there um, and all cohabitate and uh, share the space. And that's the second floor, which my uh, scanning capabilities. And we've done, we did some changes to it and uh, what have you. So we couldn't go to the next step and get these uh, changed because then we go to the $100,000 category. So we were 
Kathy would just draw. Right. right. So even on the first plans, it didn't really include everything we needed. After we looked at it, we saw some areas that we would have to extend the building to make the senior, like the seniors looked at it and decided they needed more area. And in order to give the veterans and the seniors a privacy office, we need a little more area. Um, to make the gym accessible to a kitchen so that if you ran dances or functions, you could serve into the gym, we need to move some things around. So these were very preliminary plans that we knew we'd have to go back with more money to actually get it exactly what we wanted, but it was a start to, to yeah, see what. He seemed to think they were all doable. Right. They were all doable. Just so gonna is there any more slides? Hmm? What's that? Are, are we good? Are you done? You think Almost. Done yep. So basically there's the, you know, that's the park. Um, the overall, who will benefit Parks and Rec, Elder Services, Veterans, Youths, Town Hall, get more space here, we all move out, um, who we serve, these are the people that we serve, um, after school, teens, veterans, uh, seniors, and the leagues. So basically, um, that's, that's what we have and uh, that's what we had up as of 2017 on the on the update. So. so I think one of the reasons why this was, um, you know, why we were being considered for this is because we have the location. You know, a lot of other communities have the same wish, but they don't actually have an identified location, and we do. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, so going forward, you know, what we'd have to do is, you know, this is under a five-year capital plan. Right. In in the next several months, we're going to have to get together and go up to the state house, meet with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and make our pitch to get them to improve this earlier in the few years to give us give us their support for this project. Um, you know, so nothing is in stone. There is no guarantee. There may be some money that we may have to put up for doing a little more planning than what you guys have presented, but this is a great head start. Um, you know, speaking to a few people today at uh, the state house. You know, we have a lot more done than others, so you know, I think we are in a it's good position. Start. But it's we're start. gonna have to wait a little bit until um, you know they finish, they get out of uh, session, and then you know probably after the summer we'll have to get up there and really start putting some time and effort on it. But I want to take the opportunity to have a discussion with the board because we've never really talked about it as a board, only in our strategic <coughs> planning. But even if you go and look at our strategic <coughs> planning, we had it as a TBD. You know, this opportunity came up and. We certainly didn't want to miss out on submitting an opportunity for it. Right. So, um, you know, if we have to come up with another million dollars to get the 10, you know, maybe I have a feeling that's kind of roughly where we're going to end up. That's Pretty not a problem. I, I don't, it, it's a good problem. Right. So I wanted to open it up to the board to ask questions, concerns. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, just look at the three proposals. Um, in full disclosure, I live across the street. Just right over there. But it, to me, I wouldn't want to lose any green space. I mean, I, I'd be more partial to the first one because you, we wouldn't lose any green space. And in the meadow, right. I know someone who walks their dog by there every day. That gets really swampy, <laughs> any kind of rain. I don't know how you could build there unless you raised the level of the elevation there. I, and I wouldn't want to lose the green space. Marty knows a lot about that too, yeah. One of the things that we did do when we asked Dale to do, we said just look at that. Did we own that property or something we could do and we wanted to make sure if a grant or something came up along? We, you know, obviously you had invested the money to do it, we were looking at it for 20 years. So when we decided to uh, look at this location, we said, knowing that we were going to lose half in the back, we said, look at every place that we own on this 4.5 acre parcel yep. and tell us where it could go if we chose to put it there. So that's why they did the three spots and to see, again, quickly pro con, what you gain, what you lose. So they're still saying, this next step, like Marty said, the hundred thousand dollar feasibility study is then when they go and start drilling down, start checking the, the soils to say could it actually go there if you want it. I love the idea where the barn is now because that's the barn's kind of an eye sort of begin with. All right, that's gotta go away. Yeah, <laughs> the, just kind of an eye. A big leaf blower. <laughs> you can get that out of there. Marty, don't be a fan. It's a long bowling alley. You lost yeah. some of the things that you could do if you moved it. But like I said, right. not, there's nothing cast in stone. Which one? We and you still need lot. parking. If you take up all that area yeah. of uh, community center, you need parking. Well, so once you lose the green yeah. space, you never get it back. Yeah. You I could do it there, though, because they, they, did, they did come and do uh, the Teslas in, the, in all the locations. Green space. Yeah. Right. We got four acres of green space. No. That field gets used all the I time by 
Yeah. We'll all the, all the game. Yeah. yeah. But also, I know, but all those children will be using young. it as a community center now. <laughs> They'll get another opportunity to use it in a different yeah. way. Tree huggers. I mean, something that we don't have. We oh, yeah, had tree huggers. I, I'm fairly certain, though, that would have some sort of Article 97 requirement to replace the space somewhere else. So why not use the corridor that's available it's already sort of dirt right now that we're all well i think we're a little I, I, I gotta be honest with you yep. guys yep. We're, we're way ahead of this yeah. this okay. is great though we're, we're, we're the cart is way before the horse on this very exciting you get um, excited because when we had this all done it was exciting but I, I, but i would money, assume so. mr schultz even though you may not like the locations that are being presented i, I assume based on your comments you would support something like this and i think that's what i'd like to get from the board just, i support the location right across my house i just i wouldn't want to lose green space Right, you're saying Mrs. you want corridor. And they can't have it off the road a bit, too. Right. Mrs. Minupelli. Yeah, I, I love the one slide that you show what was set back where you're utilizing. Yeah, it was a great use of that entire corridor. Right. I yeah, also right think, there. I think it's great that, that you had everyone's input in it. I'd like to see more in terms of team use. Like, if it's an intergenerational like a teen center we totally floor we covered all like that. that we we met with youth services we had one of the rooms upstairs was a game room there was a computer lab for them the youth services office was going to be up there so we, yeah, we completely met yeah. with youth services and all their needs and you know and you know different groups would use it at different times teenagers would be using a lot of the facilities at night that the seniors were using during the day so a lot of the multi-purpose rooms get used by both groups they can use the gym they might be able to use the <coughs> kitchen to do things so we yeah, talked about the all other that. thing i was going to say was um in addition to that sort of you know sh sharing the space is also some area for community groups that would be readily available and accessible right because even though you're using this it seems like primarily for municipal office purposes that are current it's it, to consider town use boy scouts right. girl mm -hmm. scouts like they do um, here right they exactly mm -hmm. like some other designated mm -hmm. area and you might have already done that i couldn't really that. see i need glasses to well see you know i didn't want to agree to yeah. every single point but it is exactly what lynn said that the, all the all those uses uh users and the uses were put yeah. um to tax to get them in a, a list of things and those were things that were mentioned i, I hate the, i hate to sound like a pest but we are kind of limited on time. No, and, no. And well, we are kind of putting the cart before the horse. So <laughs> right. I wanted to give the other board members an opportunity to speak. I haven't heard from Mr. O'Leary or Mr. Masseri. Sure. So I wanted to, if, if they had any questions or concerns or have any comments. Do you like the drone shots? Yes. Like drone. <laughs> Pretty good. Marty did those. Yeah. Love them. And, and he did it within the law, by the way, Kate. Yes, right. he did. Nice. He's registered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by way of Valley. There was <laughs> no snow or ice in his way when he did it. Mr. Valeri. Uh, I think the potential for $10 million up to $10 million being available uh, certainly makes this a far more uh, viable mm -hmm. project. Uh, it's something that certainly can be deemed more easily sold in the community. But without it, I, I think we have you know, some issues here. But, uh, oh, great time. Yeah, for sure. So I think it's terrific. I think, you know, it's uh, been shepherded through the legislature. is terrific. And by Representative Jones and, and the administration. We're ahead of the curve for everybody else, so let's jump on it and take advantage yep. of it. Yep. And again, we do have the space, um, so we have the ability to, uh, yep. to do it. So. About eight weeks, we're going to jump on it. Okay, eight weeks, we're going to get together. Between now and the next eight weeks, we're going to prepare a plan. We're going to get up there, and we're going to go sure. make some visits and advocate. But I need to have the support of the board before we do right. anything. Because if we don't have the support of us, then this is we can just say we're good and move on. But um, but I did have to confirm today. I did make a call up there to make sure this isn't a matching funds opportunity. This is ten million dollars of capital money, and yes, we're gonna we have to put up some money, but it shouldn't have to be a lot. Um, but but Mr. Masseri. do you know what the timing is? Michael? So this is in the five-year capital plan. So you. It could be in the fifth year, it could be in the fourth year. It all depends on how much we can get up there and advocate for it. We're going to request the support now to do it within the next year. Uh, so that the goal is to get the approval within the within this existing fiscal year. So what you're saying then is in October we'll be looking for some money to put together a 
appropriate plans present the state. Mr. Gilberto. Uh, sorry, if you want to respond. No, you go ahead. I'll that was going to be my next comment, actually, Mr. Masseri. So I think one of the things we need to keep our eye on is where the opportunity comes up to advance the planning effort so that when we are um, moving towards that time when the money could be released from the state, we know exactly what we're looking for and what we're trying to build. Um, the chairman and I, and I have had some discussion. I briefed the, uh, in, uh, the I won't say even new, the public works director um, relative to where things stand. Um, I think we're all aware that we had approved funding for a uh, facilities master plan back in October of last year uh, because of the transition in the department and the other priorities that have uh, bubbled up in the past year. We have not initiated that project at this point in time. It's something that I think we certainly need to do, uh, but might want to adjust our strategy a bit to reflect this available funds. Um, again, no final decisions have been made, but I, I do think it certainly is, is fair and, and transparent for us to recognize that there may, be, may need to be some action taking place at the October town meeting, depending yep. upon the feedback we get. Yep. So, you know, the, the, uh, Don, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think you may have answered that question. I was just curious the nature of it, whether it was just a, an outright grant, matching grant, the low interest loan, or what you're saying it's a grant? Yes, sir. It's in the capital plan. The money's available. They have to release it to us for this project. Uh, and it, it will follow, obviously, the same similar path that we did for the schools. You know, we'd have some reporting we'd have to do and so on. We'd have to submit plans, get them approved in advance. So they would, the state would be partners with us in this project. But the money is for this project. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is you know, it, over the next six to eight weeks, I really do want to meet with Mary Perenni. I would ask you, Michael, when you make some time, because you know, we, want this, we want this facility for our seniors as well yeah, to be state-of-the-art sure. for them. Because I'll tell you what, they have waited long enough for a facility for them to uh, enjoy their years here, the remaining years in this town. And it should be state-of-the-art for them. It should be a wonderful place for them to feel like they're at home. And right. we want to make sure this design accommodates our seniors. And then guess what? Then we accommodate all of us second. That's my personal opinion. I think we can do it all equally, but sure. I'm telling you, my my, um, you know, I really want to focus on that because yeah, well, given given we haven't we done it in a long time. Yeah. yeah. Accommodate so seniors. Yeah. I mean, they're that because you're a senior. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I was really talking about Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, we're going to need their participation on this, and I know you guys have put a ton of time in this. And we've been working with Mary. She's been at all of my yeah. meetings that we've done. Once we, we first started as, as a recreation center, there's no question. But then it grew very quickly to in mm -hmm. involving our seniors first, and then youth services, and then it moved to veterans as well. Yeah. But Mary's been involved, and, and Mary and I are on another um, committee together, and they're working at looking at, you know, they're looking for senior to make Housing. Yeah. Make, well, to make North Reading more senior friendly, and so that's one of their main goals yeah. too. And I've met with them, and I talked to them about this, and so I think we're all on the same page. Yeah. And Mary certainly is up to date on everything we've talked about. And, so. You know, and let's face it, you can even see it in our budgets that we approved. You know, we're going to bring in new people with uh, an expertise in, you know, in this issue associated with drugs, right? We're going to be bringing in some new support people. This is a facility we can design and build where we can have some privacy. We can allow right. a place for people right. to get counseling get support right. you know we have all these great tools but we don't have <coughs> locations to right. execute them and we got to integrate that into all this yep. and i think that's what they want to hear when we get up yeah, in the hill we're going to capture all those bases and this issue with the yeah, opiates is an issue that this people. governor and lieutenant governor really want to see communities address and i think we should use this facility as part of our solutions when we do that right. okay so yeah. i do appreciate everyone coming tonight um i'm excited about this I think the timing is good. Um, and, you know. So we don't have to run like 8,000 more wine and food socials to raise the money for this? Um, <laughs> Do we can go towards something yeah. else. I, I, I think Keep we it can go back. Yeah. We'll go to something I, else. I, I did have a conversation with the finance director and the town administrator today about you know, some creative ideas and where we can get the money to do the final study on this. Right. You, know, you mentioned $100,000. I, I certainly think it's going to be a little more than that. But we have some resources, but I think we should... You know, let's give an opportunity to you know regroup on this. I'd like to present that to the board before right. and have discussions with the board and associate with what kind of money we may need for the next phase of this. I'm still trying to find out what exactly what that is for you, so we know. I mean, how big of a study do we have to do here? Just you know, like a quick idea. We did it back in 2014 with Gail. We looked at, like Lynn said, all the groups that we spoke to, 
and everybody tried to want a little more space, a little more space, and there's only so much space, you know, going this way that you're not going to the quote that they gave us at that time, just off the, the cuff, how much it cost to build today, would have been 6.7 million to 8 million, and that did not include the parking lot, et cetera, and uh, moving the, the building. So as we start to add on more, and that's what we said to everybody, it can't be the Taj Mahal, it's gonna be a working place that uh, after listening to veterans and the seniors and the youth center and us, yeah. everybody said, okay, we want it to be, that everybody can use the space, but there's only so much room to put it there. So uh, I think now that you know we've got the youth center and you've got the, and the uh, youth service director, and we've got the new person working on the five-year grant. We also spoke to the police chief and those, that's important to start adding some of those spaces. But yeah. And they, they might have to be shared spaces, like one private meeting room that you schedule if you use services or you schedule if you're veterans, that yeah. type of thing. And, mul and multi-purpose rooms was our biggest goal, yeah. that they could be used for different groups and that we, we looked at what they each needed to be used by different groups and, that, and put up dividers in the rooms that could divide a room into two if two groups needed and that type of stuff. So we looked at a lot of ways of sharing because believe it or not, that like Rita said, that space it gets used really quickly. You should see yeah. how quickly it, it's all used up and there's not a lot of extra space unless we end up being like three floors high instead of two floors high. So I have it, confidence it we'll get quickly. it worked out. Mm -hmm. But yeah. thank you again. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. And I look forward to us getting up to the State House. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Thank you for the folks from the water, wastewater. We're going to get an update. That's the next thing on the agenda. It's actually on the desktop. Oh, it is. Thank you, Maureen, for the presentation. Mr. Clark. Good evening. Um, I am here with uh, Rob Williamson from Wright Pierce is with me again tonight, as he has been for so many meetings in the past. Um, we just wanted to do kind of an update. So we kind of, we, we think we jumped that last hurdle with Andover, but we're not done with the race at this point. So we wanted to kind of step through and hopefully we can do this fairly quickly. Where do we go next from here? Um, so in terms, uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Permitting, we have what's called a notice of project change. So because our original FEIR or DEIR filing said we were going to go to the MWRA for water, obviously this going to Andover for the water is a change. So we're filing a notice of project change. From that will come another set of uh, comments that we have to respond to that will file our final FEIR for. Uh, the FEIR actually serves as the Interbasin Transfer Act permit. So again, we have a million and a half gallon per day Interbasin Transfer Act permit. We're looking to go up to between 2.6 and 3 million gallons a day in the end. Um, so we need to file that. So again, that's part of this process. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the system improvements and upgrades we need to do. Um, and then we're going to kind of end at the 9 Mill Street process. Uh, property, um, as I think that's the next actual item on the board's agenda tonight. So again, notice of project change. Um, we have to <coughs> file this, tell the uh, MEPA what we're going to be doing differently than our original DEIR. Um, we're trying to get this through again. We're going to attempt to justify not only going to Andover for the water, but the increase from 2.6 million gallons per day in the DEIR to a, a number of 3.0 MGD currently. So we're looking for, uh, Wright Pierce will be submitting a, a, a scope within a week or so. Um, and then there's a, an 8 to 12 week process to prepare and file. And then a 20 day comment period and 10 days for the MEPA secretary to review. So most of these, uh, these time frames are kind of statutory. They go with, with MEPA that they have certain, uh, certain periods that they tend to respond to uh, filings that they receive. The FEIR, so the final environmental impact report itself, uh, we re receive approval of the notice of project change. We prepare and file the final FEIR to address the comments in the DEIR and in this notice of project change. Um, so we're going to again receive a scope from Wright Pierce for the work that needs to be done based on what we receive from the notice of project change. 
Uh, we're estimating 24 weeks to prepare and file. There will again be a public comment period. Um, and then they'll issue a, a certificate or they can issue a request for supplemental information after the seven, within seven days from the end of the public con comment period. Um, and unfortunately, if, if supplemental information is required, then we may have to file a supplemental FEIR, which again has another public comment period and another uh, you know, statutory before they issue a uh, determination period. And again, the, the Interbasin Transfer Act, I think this is the one we're probably most familiar with. Um, so the FEIR initiates the IBTA process. The Water Resources Commission begins the technical review. They have to hold two public hearings, uh, one in the Merrimack River Basin being the Donor River Basin, one in the Ipswich River Basin being the Receiver ri River Basin. Uh, they receive uh, public comment from that. Um, there's a third public hearing and then within 60 days they either approve or deny uh, the application. Um, we talked a little bit about this about there's the possibility to do a streamlined process too to say it's an inc uh, inconsequential increase in the, the flow uh, if we're successfully able to demonstrate that within a reasonable time frame our portion of our wastewater would be returned to the Merrimack River Basin that kind of drives down the number uh, <coughs> total number that would be coming. So what we're taking from the Merrimack less what we're giving back to the Merrimack in sewer flows is actually our total IBTA permit volume. Um, if it's less than a million gallon per day increase over the current level, it's what they call a uh, inconsequential, I'm not using the right term, but it, it effectively is a more streamlined process to go that route. Uh, in terms of what do we need to do just to take the water from Andover, so we need to be able to feed chlorine. We've talked about this all along um, at the two interconnections. So we need to maintain a chlorine residual in our distribution system so we don't have bacteria problems out in the system. Uh, Andover adds chlorine at their water treatment plant, but it's at Haggett's Pond. It's probably seven miles as a pipeline before it gets to the North Reading Town line. They don't add, they don't have over add chlorine at their plant and by the time it gets to our town line, it's basically dissipated. Chlorine reacts with everything in the world. It reacts with the iron in the pipe. It reacts with oxygen in the piping system. So you tend to lose your chlorine over time. By the time it gets to the North Reading border, it's very low chlorine residual. We still need to maintain safe water to the end, the far end. You think about where the Thompson Country Club is. It's a far away from Main Street or, or the Little League fields on Central Street, which is where our two interconnections are. So we would need to boost chlorine. Uh, we'd also want to add, size those facilities to be able to adjust the pH of the water. Uh, everyone's heard about the lead in incidents in Flint, Michigan, and basically we, uh, we uh, increase the pH of our water to make it less corrosive to distribution materials like lead or copper. Um, same, same treatment process that Andover uses, so we're basically mimicking their treatment process now. We just want to have the ability that if we need to down the road to be able to add that second chemical here as well. Uh, the main street, Central Street, we obviously we have a Central Street pumping station. We have a well field right there. We have plenty of property right there. Now to build the, uh, the facility, Main Street, we do not have any property right there. So you think where the, uh, the driving range is right on Main Street, um, that's where our second interconnection is. It's actually right out where that, there's a little strip of land that goes into the north side of that driving range. Um, so we need to uh, actually acquire land. Um, we would be looking to upgrade the metering equipment um, at both at both locations. Uh, just basically we want to put the most accurate metering in we can at those locations just to make sure we're not over recording or under recording the volume that's coming in. So there would be sort obviously design and uh, construction work related to that. Um, we're hoping to get this work done uh, if, if we can successfully find a piece of land and purchase it uh, to be able to actually bid next next winter and spring for this project. Um, secondary part of this, something that will be added is called a SCADA system, supervisory control and data acquisition. It's basically just instrumentation that's located through the system. Uh, we currently use it. We currently have a SCADA system that we use to monitor our, our water storage tank levels. So basically, uh, if you think of we set one of the tanks, the Moose Hill tank, as the control tank. When it gets full to a certain level, it sends a signal back and it tells the main street valve with Andover, okay, we have enough water, shut off. Or 
vice versa, in the morning the tank starts to drop when everyone gets up and starts using water. It says, wait a minute, we need water. We need you to open up. And it, you can tell it, I want you to open up to 500 gallons a minute or 700 gallons a minute. And there, it, just, it basically gives you that ability to operate your system when no one else is here. Um, there would be, so we'd be looking for you know, ability to see it here at Town Hall. Obviously, the three storage tanks we want to see. We want to see what's going on at the two Andover interconnections. We want to be able to know what's going on at the chemical feed facilities. And then there, we're talking about keeping our existing treatment plants and pumping stations operating for a period of time. Um, we'll make a decision whether we just use those. So those are basically SCADA operated on their own right now, whether we would continue to use the existing SCADA system or incorporate them into this newer SCADA system as well. Uh, water main, so water, we have made the statement here, we can take the water from Andover with the system as it currently is. So what we're showing you here is there's a series of, uh, in our master plan for water, which came out a few years before this, these were projects that would be needed primarily regardless of whether we went to MWA or Andover. We're just showing them so that when we start proposing water main work, people don't say, wait a minute, you said we were all set. We're currently all set to take water from Andover up to the 3 million gallons per day. We have other needs. Our system is getting older. It dates back to 1936. So there's a number of needs out there. Uh, the, basically, the top half of this, or the top almost all of this, is uh, just stuff that came out of the master plan. Uh, you, you can see the very bottom bullet is about redundant mains from Andover. Uh, so right now we have a connection, an 8-inch connection on Central Street and a 12-inch connection on Main Street. You know, what happens in a hot summer day if that 12-inch connection on Main Street, the pipe breaks just downstream of that connection? We're only able to draw a portion of the 3 million gallons a day through Central Street. So do we, do we actually physically construct redundant mains to allow a secondary path for that water to get here uh, in that event? Some of you will remember back about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, it was a hot summer day and the interconnection on Main Street underneath the Scud River broke. Uh, it's kind of a, one of the worst days I've had here uh, since I've been here. And basically, what did we do in that situation? We couldn't draw as much water as we want from Andover. And, and you know, basically, we just stayed till like 1.30 in the morning, and we put a, an above-ground piping because we couldn't get onto the river at that time and fix that. But we got it back up in, in service. And typically, that's what you would do is just work. But long term, would it make sense to have additional capacity? Yeah, so we're, we're throwing that in there. We don't have any existing plan right now, but uh, we will probably be doing some work in that, in that area as well. And then finally, replacement of the Tower Hill storage tank. Um, Wright Pierce has actually done an evaluation for us. We actually have an abundance of storage in our system right now. Tower Hill tank, for those of you that know it, it's the little skinny tank in the center of town. It uh, was built in 1936 when no one thought people would be irrigating their lawns like they were, so it was a a very relatively low volume tank. We actually could take that tank out of service and, uh, and still survive with our uh, system capacity we have at, outside of that with the other two storage tanks. It is the optimal place for a storage tank in town. It's dead center of town. It's on a nice high hill right there, so water wants to flow kind of to all directions in town from that tank. So it, it does definitely serve a purpose. Um, so we're gonna just look at that a little bit further. Um, you've probably seen in our capital plan in years out that the Tower Hill tank is scheduled for replacement, um, not having, again, not having anything to do with the Andover project, but just as a need based on the age of that tank. And then the fifth area we we're going to talk about, and I'll kind of defer to the next uh, agenda item, is uh, what are we going to do with the 9 Mill Street property? So that's kind of just a very, very quick overview. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Mark, you talked about the property on Main Street. I thought we owned 350 Main Street. The town already owned the dome. What is 350? So 344 so it's, it's is the, the very end on the left. Stage. It's really conservation. It's under conservation. Yeah, it's it's wetlands. Uh, if if we own it, it is not uplands at all. So the gas station Paynes is the last upland property on that side, and I believe that's 340 or 344 Main Street. 338. Probably in the Scud River. Probably it's, it's, river. I believe it would have bought the Scott, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 350 does about it, but. What does? 350. It's right behind it. Right behind the. Um, the gas station? The gas well there. The so. The U-Haul place, it, is it? Yeah, yeah the U-Haul. It's, it, 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 it's not a gas station right, anymore, right. right? It's the U-Haul place. If you recall the floods we've had, the Mother's Day flood and the, you know, the 100-year flood that occurs every 10 years or 5 years, 
that piece of property does go underground. Actually, that length of Main Street goes underground, um, where our interconnection is with Andover. We actually have a uh, it's a heavy pla heavy duty plastic cover to the vault, but that actually because it, it goes underwater, that has actually floated up and disappeared on us. It's gone across the road. Um, so it, parts of that area are very, are very subject to flooding. Mm -hmm. So how many acres do you need for this parcel that you're referring to? That you need? I mean, if we had an, an acre, we would be good. A half acre, half acre, half acre, we could probably do it. It's not a huge. Yeah. It's not a huge building. It's so not unfortunate. Not, that's a wet spot. But it's 1.2 acres. Right there, you could build it on stilts, I guess. I mean, if, if we could at least look at it, there is a way to build it where conservation isn't affected to too much. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, we need it at that somewhere at that town That's, line. That uh, is we're, right there. It's yeah. On the line. Yeah. So, I'm just, We own it. It's um, I don't know. It says the value is worth two hundred fifty-four thousand dollars. So uh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong one, Steve. It was probably yeah. but, um, one point one point two acres. If you're a diving company and you got to do training there or something, <laughs> you know maybe slot, the uh, maybe the six on Main Street. Maybe the U-Haul has expanded their parking too. They may be on town oh, property yeah. at this point oh, too. Oh, I so, bet. Yeah, I see. You look into it. Yep. No, nope, it's a good good piece I'm of curious. advice. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's 350, 350 Main Street, 1.2 acres, owned under the Care Custody Control of the Conservation Commission. Conservation Department. So that would take it. Uh, take it uh, uh, right, that would take an act. I'm looking at the same property. Yeah, conservation. Yeah, so it take an act of legislation to get out of conservation. Okay. Maybe they get a swap. Yeah. yeah, I think we. So. I would think that we could find a location of that size to designate it. Probably town-owned, undevelopable. Oh, well, I guess there's plenty of town land that's underwater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to fall. If you want to buy some, Andrew, I know someone you can talk to. All right. Do we want to, did you want to say something? I want to add one thing that we did not add on here. Um, the last time we met just before the 4th, um, some of the, um, we discussed uh, uh, that you asked for a plan from us to advise you on how to advance the sewer as well. I didn't put that on here because it was kind of more water focused, but we should have um, a dra some draft recommendations probably in the next couple of weeks for that on, on how to, um, you know, further refine what's already been um, conceptualized mm -hmm. um, so we can refine the costs and how the system might build out and, and how you might want to expand it from there on out. So that, that was another task that was on our list that you should be seeing shortly as well. Thank you. Mr. Masseri. I had asked for the meeting because I think since we got Andover's attention, we need to move forward rapidly with the sewer. Yep. It's not in a written legal agreement, and boards change, and you never know what's going to happen. Nope. So I think it's our best interest to move going. things along. The other thing I'm trying to do is to get a, a spreadsheet of all of the lots that will be covered by sewer. Yeah, we asked for that. The kinds of numbers we're dealing with to get some idea based on what uh, Pierce has said it's going to be the cost of it versus what individuals are going to have to pay. Mm -hmm. I think we need to take that into consideration before we make any final uh, decisions. But it's very important we move this thing at least to a point where uh, we have a full understanding of what it is we need to do, what the costs are. Great. So we, so we have another meeting. We don't. We have one tentatively scheduled. Tentatively, yep. And I want to make yep. sure we stay on track with that because, as part of this wastewater plan, there's some things we need to work out. Um, because you know the the entirety of the system is quite large, and it's probably not all feasible in the near short term. So I think we got to hone in on what's really the most key. Um, portions of that you, that you're really interested in. Yeah, so as Rob said, we met just before the 4th, yep. and we've got a tentatively got another meeting scheduled. Uh, but I'd say once you have your up-to-date data yep. put together, we'll yep. sit down I think very we quickly have, afterwards. We have thrown it out there, but we had never inked, inked a date. Right. So. Okay. 
Um, probably a good time to talk about Nine Mill Street. Uh, Mr. Actually, Chairman, we're just actually working on some technological type stuff. So we should have something in just a minute or two with Nine Mill Street. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, did you, you need a minute because I could certainly use a restroom break. Uh, brief, just a brief minute would be if great. If we could yes. take a recess for just five minutes, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry. I'm getting old.
we're going to reconvene. And Mr. Gilberto, if you, if you don't mind, while we're doing that, maybe we could talk about with the board members uh, reviewing the meeting schedule. Sure, that would be great. So just uh, by way of background information, although I think we put this into the meeting notes, uh, we've been advised that the state preliminary election uh, will be on uh, Tuesday, September 4th, which is an evening that we had scheduled the first meeting in September due to the Labor Day holiday on Monday, September 3rd. Uh, the board should consider having this date on a date other than Tuesday the 4th. Uh, it's not prohibited, but it's certainly strongly discouraged, and we would be prevented from having any public hearing that evening under state law. Uh, Chairman and I had a conversation, and uh, we're trying to keep the two-week window between meetings to the extent that we can, and our suggestion would be Thursday, September 6th as a potential meeting date. Um, that Obviously, we wanted to poll the board members to see their availability. So it would be Tuesday, I mean Thursday, right? Thursday. September 6th. Correct. Anybody have a conflict? I don't think so. And Mr. Chairman, you and I may be called into Boston that day, but uh, I believe we expect to be back that evening. Yeah, we have a 10 o'clock. I think yes. we're going to be called in at 10. That's my understanding, yes. What was that for? Um, I think you'd share with you after the meeting. Uh, pending labor matter in Boston. You want to go? What time is the meeting start? I believe it would be the standard 6.30. It would be 6.30, yes. And then the following one would be? Done by 9, right? Uh, it would be um, not the following week, but the week after so on Monday 17th. the 17th. And the board would we already sign. already had that scheduled. That's correct. That's a scheduled meeting, and that would be the date on which the board would be asked to sign the October town meeting warrant. Right. And then the one after that would be October town meeting. Um, I believe we had a regular meeting scheduled for Monday, October 1st, and that would be the Warren Article hearing. Oh, okay. So October Tommy is the 8th, right? It's the 15th. The 15th. It's a legal holiday on the 8th, and therefore it's on the 15th. So 6th and Hold 17th. On a second. That would be the proposed September meeting schedule, yes. August 20th, Monday, August 20th. Everybody okay with those dates? All right, August 20th, right? Yeah, that's the next meeting. August 20th, September 6th, September 17th. My, um, October 15th. Gilberto, did you say October 1st? October 1st, yes. I don't have that one. But the I 15th for town meeting? Correct. October 1st would be a regular meeting. It would also be the warrant article hearing. Um, the board will need to meet at least once after the 17th in order to have the hearing after it's signed the warrant, uh, but before the 15th of October. And it's unable to meet on the 8th due to the legal holiday. Good. Now we're ready? I believe so, yes. All right, so we get the uh, review of the meeting schedule done. Back to town administrator. Mr. Clark. <coughs> Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we have a, just a brief PowerPoint presentation that uh, the town planner put together uh, with some bullets uh, relative to 9 Mill Street, uh, really intended to just put forth the parameters um, so that we can take some guidance from the board this evening and then take the necessary steps uh, after this to come up with a plan um, for the use of the property. Um, again, just for the, the public that may or may not be familiar, this is a residential property. It's a four plus acre residential property on Mill Street one parcel removed from the Reading Town line that we acquired uh, in 2016 as part of our efforts to plan for a potential MWRA interconnection with the town of Reading. We believed it would be the ideal site um, and the, uh, the ideally accessible site 
for locating a pump station uh, for a water main where our potable water would come in from the town of, um, of Reading. Um, with that, um, with the election of the uh, so-called Andover option and the 99-year IMA and us now being in the permitting process, uh, we, we've certainly made a policy determination that is subject to the appropriate permitting that was discussed earlier, as well as the um, uh, potential uh, for appropriation for any funding that might need to be done. We believe we've addressed all the uh, construction appropriations at the June Town meeting here for the North Reading. Uh, whatever work needs to be done would obviously need to be approved in Andover. But uh, that's the policy direction that we've taken. So we're trying to take the effort here to plan for this property. So just a couple of bullets uh, to point out. The property at 9 Mill Street is in a Residence A RA zoning district, has 4.36 acres, 97 linear feet of frontage along Mill Street, which is a public way accepted by the town. Property conforms to the zoning bylaw, qualifying as a, qualifying as a limited frontage lot under our zoning bylaw. Um, it must have at least 50 foot of frontage uh, and 120,000 square feet. Uh, in area as well as the ability to have inscribed within it a 250 foot diameter circle. Uh, town wishes to sub well, I should say this. The recommendation is to subdivide the property so that a lot containing the existing house and driveway can be separated and sold and the remaining property could remain being retained by the town with frontage in the event that it is needed in the future for water supply or for that matter any other public purpose. The town also wishes to convert an existing utility easement on the portion of the residential property that would be sold from just a, w w what is now a utility uh, easement containing an existing water main to being a utility and access easement, meaning that we would have the ability to uh, pass and repass over that easement to get to the remaining town-owned portion. Um, property is not large enough, nor does it have enough frontage to allow it to be subdivided into two conforming house lots, or conforming lots, I should say, However, the property could potentially be subdivided into one conforming limited frontage lot and one non-conforming lot if relief were granted for the non-conforming lot. So the relief would be through our Zoning Board of Appeals uh, in terms of the frontage on Mill Street if we were to subdivide and create frontage on both lots, as well as a waiver um, from the Planning Commission upon approving a, a, an ANR plan. Um, so I kind of skipped ahead here. The relief, again, would be a zoning variance uh, for uh, frontage because, again, we need to have 50 feet. Um, we would, excuse me, it's supposed to be 100 feet. We would be below that. Um, this would also need to occur during the subdivision review for the A&R approval by the Planning Commission, uh, and there would need to be an endorsement by the CPC. Um, again, as I mentioned, the town would in ideally retain its existing water easement over a portion of the property containing the house because there is a water main under it right now that is in use um, but we would also further burden the property with this access easement so and we're going to put up an image here that'll make this a lot easier for people to understand so i'll just go through this and we'll put the image up um, if the town were to pursue building a structure on its retained parcel we assume we would need to file a notice of intent with the conservation commission at that time because there are wetland on this parcel uh, and there is wetland on their area uh, of frontage along mill street that does not include the driveway, which would be the portion we would seek to retain if we were to actually subdivide it. Uh, the conforming parcel the with the house and driveway located on it would have frontage of 50 linear feet and an area of 122,000 square feet and would contain a 250 foot diameter inscribed circle containing the house and septic system, thereby continuing to conform in RA as a limited frontage lot. What it basically means is we'd be selling to the open market um, a conforming lot with the with um, the appropriate frontage for a limited frontage lot, which a lot is right now, with the appropriate size and appropriate design for a uh, diameter for that 250-foot circle to be inscribed. So with that, uh, I thank Mr. Clark for coming to our rescue here with the image. But we have a uh, copy of it here. And I'm not sure how to... Mark, do you know how to get this sidebar to go away here? <laughs> I guess we'll just, well, I think we can make it work. So, and, and I'm going to step over to this spot and point up here. So this is Mill Street up here. The entirety of the area surrounded in yellow is the whole 4.36 acre house lot. Um, the scenario that we looked at is one where if you were to, to draw a property line and retain the frontage that we've been talking about, this would be that 50 feet of frontage for the existing house lot. 
Um, the house is uh, down in here. I think, believe there's a pool to the rear of it, and there's a leach field also out here, and there's a driveway that kind of comes uh, in through here. And that 50 feet of frontage is here. That 250 foot diameter circle would be here. The property line that would be drawn uh, would effectively run along this purplish color. Is that the right color mark? Pink and black. Pink and black. This is an approximate where we basically are retaining this area as town owned lot. This green line delineates the wetland, so the wetland is uh, outside of the circle, and this area in here is not wet. Is that right, Mark? That's correct. So the intent was to keep as much of the upland as possible. And uh, so you see we're basically drawing this line in a fashion that divides the parcel, creates this, um, the existing lot with its existing restrictions on it, and a town owned lot with frontage. That was kind of the discussion that we had internally about what the ideal scenario we felt would be for um, following our existing zoning bylaws and based on retaining the frontage. Um, this would require some approvals from the Board of Appeals. Uh, I did hear from the Chairman of the Board of Appeals and I think he has some thoughts about other ways we might be able to proceed with this. And I think that there, there has, from what I gather, um, th there may be, I don't want to say concern, I don't want to say opposition, but some concern about the limited frontage and what that might mean and, uh, and and whether that would be an option or not. It's obviously subject to the decision of the entire board, but uh, we hear that concern. We take it seriously, obviously. Um, and, and so for that reason, this kind of reflects what we think we'd like to see if we could get there, but uh, there are obviously restrictions that we would need to work within and approvals that we would need to, to seek to obtain. Uh, there was a motion in the packet that I would say was very um, strictly written in proceeding with getting an engineer a survey to kind of make this plan real. Uh, I thank Mark for his effort to it, but there would need to be some... John. What's that? John did most of the work. John so Lippel. we thank John, who's not here now, but the town engineer kind of put this on paper for us to be able to see it. But we would need to have something a little more detailed in order to submit it for any action. And so based on the feedback, we've kind of altered the motion, and there is a, uh, I'll say, a, maybe a, an alternate motion that's in the meeting packet that would adopt some principles um, based on this, but leave flexible the ability to achieve it. And that's kind of where we stand. So I think the first question is, is there kind of a consensus as to what we want to end up with here? You know, ending up with a house lot, trying to maximize the value of that house lot by reducing any nonconformity with it, maintaining the access on uh, Mill Street. One of the challenges with this is this area here is wet. So there would be wetland permitting that would need to take place for us to be able to access uh, the upland area <clears throat> by maintaining the easement um, in the existing area if we can kind of get in there um, as a utility and access easement then we feel we can kind of access the property still in the absence of constructing our own access in the wetland here mrs minupelli just a quick question and i know it's it's this is really detailed but you mentioned something about the line and, and the area of the leaching field and is any part of that, it it's looks like it goes into the, what you've carved out as the lot that we want to retain and it just sort of echoes of previous land swap or land delineation issues that we've had to address the before. The leaching field so behind the house. Where though? Because where he showed us on the Thing it was. So it looks like it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I guess he took the point. Of, yeah. He, so the leaching field is what the town administrator is pointing to right now. So it is within. It is without the the area that we're looking to take. It stays with the original parcel. Um, one of the things about a limited frontage lot is the house and the leaching field also have to lie within that 250 foot radius uh, diameter circle which they do in this case so that's why you sort of have it curved in a bit to afford the left I guess the westerly lot the uh, the 250 foot diameter there correct and, and again this is something that was put together relatively quickly today um, Wow. We definitely would want a, a you know, a, a surveyed plan before we went and sold the property. Um, I apologize. This is a picture I had to take with my phone. Uh, our scanner will not do color. It would have come out black and white, oh, so you I couldn't have seen any of the colors, which is why the, the circle looks more like an oval. It actually is an, a, a circle of that 
a you know 125 foot diameter circle. You have an iPhone? Oh, yeah. Use? Yeah, but I took it on an angle. I didn't take Tur it. Turbo scan. Yeah, no, it was a bit of operator error on my end. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mr. Schultz, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is good if we can do this. If that's, that's the uh, if we can't split this lot off. Is there another use we could use that existing house for town purposes for anything? Or we're always looking for more space for. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a residential house. It doesn't yeah. really lend itself to recreation or anything. There's not much parking there. Um, we should get back know, our investment. DPW is not, it, it, we're in the process of maintaining. Julie maintains the town buildings to a good degree. It's difficult to transition and start maintaining. And there's a swimming pool on the property. It's not really beneficial to us right. to keep I'm just saying if we can, yeah. split it. Yeah. I, so tonight, what I'm, I believe you said is we have a motion that will at least give some flexibility to at least get a, a certified drawing done. Is that right? So Surveying? So the thinking was that we would not go to that step, but instead would consult with the Board of Appeals and the Planning Commission either through informal discussions with the, their chairs or other representatives or potentially consult with them informally in a public meeting yeah. to get their feedback about what would be acceptable, what would not be acceptable. Um, you know, if we were, uh, you know, uh, the uh, if we were a property, a private property owner looking to come in, we draw a plan up, submit it, and wait for feedback. So, I guess the question is: Is there any board members that have an objection to going through this process, subdividing it? We would sell off the parcel where the property is located, and then retain the other portion, Mr. Masseri. I think it's important that we maintain it at least until. The FEIR is passed, then and over water is certain. And after that, you know, yep. I, I don't disagree. But this has got to be a lot of work it's done. It's not the end of the work, right? Yeah. But I think but the work think can be done in the meantime. Wait for that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. This is a good alternative. Yeah. Because we have an opportunity to keep the land that we hopefully won't need, at least in the short term. But sell the property and get some of the cash that we could tie up in that land. Sure. Well, we just don't need to be maintaining a house with facilities and pools and things like that. It just doesn't fit in what we do. So, you know, just in terms of what is it costing us to maintain the facility, obviously we have to keep it nominally heated during the winter time. Uh, we are going out and cutting the grass. Um, we don't have the swimming pool open. People are, you know, we're not having parties down there, but we're doing the minimum we have to do. But, it, you know, it's, it's a vacant house, and vacant houses don't tend to appreciate in value. You can get firm income in, you can get, you know, different problems going on, and there's not somebody there looking at the house on a daily basis. Different problems arise. So it's not something that it's an emergency we need to sell it, but it's something that, you know, the house itself for long term is not really a, a DPW type. Uh, project that we want to get involved in. And can we get an assessment from town assessor on this? So we have an idea of what we're talking about. We get sure. if we can actually execute this, are we going out? Is this a two hundred thousand dollar sale? Is it a half a million dollar sale? I'd like to have an idea. We better get an idea from our local realtor than mm -hmm. from our assessor. No. Assessors assessing is different than yeah. market True. value. So how do we do that? You get a real estate appraisal. Yeah. Show, show you real estate uh, people, local real estate people, you know, what's it, this is what we're looking to do, what's it worth, and a single family home in the neighborhood is worth $500,000, or $50,000, whatever it is. So the town administrator can do that, do we, need, we don't need a, no. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah. So just, just in relation to, uh, you know, obviously if we don't, if we don't need the property, we should dispose of it, but I think, you know, this particular parcel could be critical for us uh, in the future when it comes to sewerage, we may need some sort mm -hmm. of uh, locations for, uh, some sort of pumping stations, you know, somewhere in the neighborhoods yeah. uh, along the way. And I think it would be important for us to uh, retain this upland portion um, for that purpose. And, uh, and again, just in relation to the current easement that's across the property, it's just for water currently. Should we be addressing the issue for, for potential wastewater in the form of an easement, or does that count? I, I don't know. I think we have to ask this council. Yeah, I think we'd have to go back and look at how it's worded. Uh, it's shown on this plan as a water easement. It does currently have, there's actually a water main that runs through this. Right. It goes back out to uh, Park, Park Street, Street through this piece of property. Um, 
have to look at the wording on that original easement. Typically, they're recorded as utility easements versus water easements. Um, so we'll have to look at that to make so sure it's get that clarified. Otherwise, you know, we need to, yeah. at least for this parcel, before we sell it, put it up, yeah. you know, for our future needs. Um, and again, as far as the access to this particular part of this portion of the property, as the town administrator pointed out, you know, just to the north side of the current driveway is somewhat wet. And for, for my standpoint, I think, you know, we need to address this up front and if we need to go to conservation and, and do some sort of a uh, compensating, uh, what's the term? Uh, Swamp. Replication. Swamp. Was it? Replication. Yeah, replication, which is about one and a half times what are we going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got certainly enough room to do it here. Uh, we should do that and provide yeah. for a separate access rather than an easement um, if, we, if we're not going to go an easement route. And even, it, even if it does become an easement, I think it should be separate from the driveway. I don't think the town should be obligated at any point in the future to uh, maintain any portion of a, of a driveway to a private residence. And there's enough room there, it's just as a wetlands yeah. uh, mm -hmm. issue. So if we could address that up front, I think that would be key. Uh, put some crush and run in there, and whoever's buying the property would have full knowledge of uh, you know, what they're buying. And yeah. I think that's going to be important, too, as far as disclosure to uh, potential buyers or future buyers. So to me, I think I'd like to see that addressed up front. It might cost mm -hmm. us a little money now, but for future purposes, it addresses the issue where we have clear, clear yeah. shot, clear access to the property. And I think we should address that up front. Great. So, uh, and I think the uh, alternative motion that's uh, in your packet uh, allows sufficient uh, opportunity for the administration to look at uh, several potential uh, ways to subdivide the property and retain what we think we need. So I think it's a good idea and I think we should move forward on it. And to, to Bob's point, you know, maybe we should hold off on, on the sale until things are further along with the FEIR and so we're assured that things are sure. we're not going to get messed up on us because we'd hate to go back and yeah. have to repurchase something we just sold, right? But if we can get it to a point where it's we're shelf it, on again, the I shelf think we should get to October Town Meeting's approval to do it because, again, yeah. based on the timeline, it was still within, you know, next spring, we should have a pretty firm uh, idea as to what's going to be approved and what's not. And, and, and what about potentially renting the house now, putting it out for rent? So from a, from a cash flow standpoint, it's something that would be desirable, but uh, I... I'm hesitant to get into a situation of having tenants and what that might mean come the time to sale to the, for the sale of the house and potential issues. So it, it's the risk of getting somebody in there and the challenges you might have of a, a tenant being in there. We had a great tenant and the previous owner, obviously, they cared for the house for us. There were no issues, but you could very easily have a situation where you, you have a problematic tenant and now we have that responsibility or perhaps that obstacle to selling the property. So that would be my concern about that. I mean, right now we are maintaining it. We did maintain it through this winter based on, on uh, when the property was sold. Um, I, I think I'd be hesitant to, okay. to, to take that on. I really would. That's fine. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, um, I think one thing we should have town council to look at the easement that's on there now for the water line. And ex we can't expand it once we sell off the other property. So it, it should be rewritten so it expands if it covers wastewater. Mm -hmm. It's got to be in there before we start right. selling off the other property. Yeah. Well, a reserved. Right. And three reserve, reserve. Reserve. No, but reserving it, like we said, right? And, and it may need to be a different, I'm sorry, through you, Mr. Chairman, it may, be, it may need to be a different size just in order for the, to have the appropriate separation between the water and the wastewater, yeah. too. No. If the current size may not do it. Mrs. Manuelli. Just quick, just a quick, so the yellow is the entire parcel. Correct. And this would be the new property line. And all the way around. Yeah. So no, I can see this. Good. Just, yeah, so just where did this lot come from? The If you think about the office condos at the corner of Park and Main Street, yeah. those that property, the property at, I believe it's 364 Park Street, and this property were all one property back in the 1980s, and they were subdivided into three parcels. Two became residential limited frontage lots, being this one and the one on Park Street, and then where it says highway business down at the the bottom here. That's actually uh, 348 Main Street, or 348 Park Street, where those office co condos are. So it was one big lot that got chopped up into three lots. So the new property line would be the outer yellow edges included with the black and pink line down the middle, right? 
Correct. And the black and pink would be the, the secondary parcel. The outline of the black and pink would be the so, secondary. So this would be one parcel contiguous, and this would be another parcel. And that leaves about 122,000 with the, the yellow parcel and about 67,000 with the, the pink parcel, if you will. Mr. Minupelli. I'm I, all right. I thought I understood, but now I just don't. <laughs> now, I, now I'm mistaken. So. Do it again. Where's the. Wh what would be the, the new? The house lot is going to go around the town's property. Okay, it's going to encompass the town's property. It's going to hook, hook around it as this is proposed. Now, why would we not just take the part that. We're highlighting right there. Because the, I believe we're trying to conform to some sort of a regulation. With the so, so this plan is needed for a non conforming okay. frontage. Yeah, this plan, the house lot that's remaining is still a conforming lot. It's a limited frontage lot, but it's a conforming lot. Uh, if so we just why snap don't you just keep going down straight down the line? Why do you need to go around? I because you have to have 122,000 square feet, and that's the only the way okay, to get it is to get there carve off the portion of the parcel that doesn't if you carve out any more, more for us it takes away from them being a conforming lot and there's no access okay. off of route 28 right no That's so the Ipswich River is kind of to the it's kind of in the uh, the bottom Maureen, left hand portion if you could come to the mic makes up the town line. Mrs. Dory hi um, so the person who buys the house, the private house, and basically their house would be, usable space would be the, the 250 diameter circle. But technically, since they own all the other property, wouldn't they need a, an easement to get across this easement so that they can maintain their property over there or walk no. their dog? No, they have access good. right there. They can walk over the, the things over well, yeah, well, if it is wetland, how would they, how would it ever be usable to, like, how could they ever be expected to maintain that back part, you know, like, if it got... Well, they won't. They it's not maintained now. Cur currently, the majority of the site is just wooded. Yeah, yeah, it's just woods. Other than where the house is, if you see kind of where the blue line comes down, and then the pink line continues down, yeah. it's all wetlands and it's all woods currently, mm -hmm. so they're not maintaining the it, they're not using it for much wood. at this point. Yeah. But they need but it. Wouldn't they, be, wouldn't they need to be able to get from the circle to the... Big area, the bigger area up front, like Over there? The, cutting across what you want from the town property. No, not really. They're, they're just just for recreational purposes. Yeah. It's all woods, <coughs> but they need it. They need that for their to be we cut. Need, we need it if we're going to keep it we, conforming, right. non-conforming lot. Right. right. But there are other ways to, to look at it. Okay. And I think the motion would allow the administration to look at it in other ways. Yeah. I'd like to hear the motion if I could. If no one else has a question, I'd, I'd like to have the motion so we can discuss it. The, the proposed motion, or you want, to, uh, you want me to make the motion or propose? So can you, you propose it? it? I'll let you know what the proposed motion yes. is. Yes. Is to uh, direct the administration to pursue a plan to divide Nine Mill Street into a portion to remain town owned and a portion to consist of an existing single family home, driveway, accessories, and associated utilities to be sold upon approval by town meeting upon approval of the board of select. So that would allow clear. all the parties yep. that would be involved to get together prior to come up with a, it may be this plan, but oh, it's a possibly a reconfigured plan. And allow us to do what we need to do to make yeah. it. In order to, yeah. again, it it's the uplands that we need yeah. to retain. I'd second that motion. Did you make it? I didn't make it yet. Oh. I was just like. No, I asked for a proposal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> As opposed so, to what I wanted my lawyers because I know you guys. Yeah. Uh, so what was originally proposed was was specific to this, and we may want to look at some other alternatives. I like that. I, okay. I can live with that. All right. So I'll move, Mr. Chairman. I'll second. Uh, to direct the administration to pursue a plan to divide Nine Mill Street into a portion to remain town-owned and a portion to consist of the existing single-family home, driveway, accessories, and associated utilities to be sold upon approval by town meeting and upon approval of the Board of Selectmen. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Minupelli. Any more discussion? Mr. Gilberto, going once? No, nope, that's the motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Okay, so next, um, Mark, are you heading out now? Uh, 
I was planning to, yeah. Can we think? just talk about one thing before you go that I had on my old and new business? And we've had a lot of, I've at least received a lot of calls about brown water and people continue to have brown tap water. If you could just briefly just inform the community why this is happening in, in certain areas, not in all areas. Is it safe? Do we have a problem? Is there concerns? So I could give you what my theory is based on what we've seen. It um, would be helpful. Most of you have seen we flush the hydrants in the fall. Uh, what we try to do when we flush the hydrants is stir up the, there's a little bit of fine iron sediment on the bottom of the pipes out in the street. And we're trying to stir that up by increasing the flows in the pipe and pull that out the fire hydrant. So if there's ever a main break in the winter or a fire where they use a hydrant, we're not giving people days of discolored water. In the kind of the category of no good deed goes unpunished, you'll remember the board put a stage one water ban on uh, last month. And what the stage one water ban did was it said there's two days a week you can water based on uh, where you live. You can either bait water, I think it's Tuesdays and Fridays, or you can water Wednesdays and Saturdays. Saturdays. Effectively what that did was it marginally re reduced our water demands. The goal of that was reduce water demands. Effectively what it did was it shifted people that were may have been watering three days a week to watering two specific days per week. And what we see is on those two specific days during the typical watering hours, the towers drop a lot more than they normally would. So what we effectively did was we, we reduced water use a little bit, but we confined water use to certain hours. And what happens when, when that happens is it's almost like we open a fire hydrant out in the system. So from four to six in the morning, water's leaving the tanks at a very high rate of speed. And the streets near the tanks, the water's moving very quickly. And the effect of the water moving very quickly is it stirs up that iron sediment. Not as much as when we're flushing, but what happens is for those couple of hours in the morning, and going back and tracing when we received the calls to which days the watering was allowed, that's effectively what we're seeing. So we've had a couple days of rain, no complaints this week. Um, but last week, on the, there were hot, hot, dry days, and those days that watering was permitted. So I think we've, we're effectively getting the message out that you're only supposed to water on certain days, but kind of the unexpected side effect of that is it's stirring up the water in the morning. So it would be helpful if maybe the transcript could, if we could give them something maybe to to put in there in the paper this week, just explain that. I don't know if you have something written up that you can provide Maureen, unless Maureen you have enough that you can do it on your own. I just want to make sure we inform what we can. Okay. I, then, yeah, I, I had an email that I sent to a couple people last week. I could just copy her that basically and describes then what I think. On our is. town website, I think we have a, a water link on our website that we, we do up to yep. updates we can just add add whatever you decide on there as well so people we can send them there thank you well, thank you for staying so late and again patrick welcome aboard thank you very much. And, uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon right, thank you guys. nice job all right uh at the kenny field concession stand any updates? Anything Mr. you need us to do tonight? Mr. Chairman, through you, I have two, two um, uh, payment requisitions for the designer that I'm asking the board to approve this evening. Uh, we are still not ready to ask for payment requisition number nine to be um, paid. Um, there is some um, work to be done to clean up the paving. Um, I believe that we're going to get that done in a timely fashion. There will be seal coating done as well um, uh, thereafter, uh, but uh, not ready to authorize payment number nine yet. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. Chairman, I move to approve payment of invoice number 29264 in the amount of $1,265.30 and invoice number 29382 in the amount of $1,760 from the Arthur, K. Arthur Kenny Field Construction Appropriation to CBI Consulting, LLC. Second. Motion is second. Any more discussion? Any discussion, I should say. None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?
Unanimous. That's it. <clears throat> okay. Approve May and June legal bills. Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. So I'd like to offer an update relative to where things stand on the legal bills because we've had a couple of things that have uh, put pressure on that budget and that's uh, come through in the, the May and uh, June uh, billing. So just to refresh everybody's memory, our total appropriation for town council in the fiscal year 2018 budget was $115,000. Um, we identified an additional $20,000 unexpended from a previous year uh, for legal purposes available um, for our um, for these costs as well. And the water department identified approximately $9,000 um, in funding out of the water enterprise to address costs associated with the negotiation for the intermunicipal agreement that exceeded what we had available in the budget in the amount of $8,000 for water-related legal purposes. So uh, in the end, where we stand this evening is we're asking the board to approve the payment of these two bills. Um, we have um, a, uh, an overage uh, in the amount of approximately um, $1,600. Strike that. That's correct. We have an overage of the amount of about $1,600 that we're looking at in the overall budget. However, uh, what we have not done yet is um, basically assign the cost associated with the sale of town-owned land, which was conducted in the beginning of the fiscal year, for which the town received payment to cover those costs. We have not offset the legal budget by that amount yet. And that amount was approximately $1,900, which would effectively put us at, at even. Um, we never know if we're going to receive any lingering bills relative to legal documents or subscriptions which could come in um, if we were to run into a further issue. We have up to $1,700 available out of the water enterprise from an April bill that we have not yet charged off to water. So I just kind of wanted to offer that description. Um, we've got a plan to address the funding. We did exceed the cost. It's not a surprise that we exceeded the cost based on a number of things that are going on, particularly in water, but also relative to collective bargaining. Um, and so uh, that's where we stand uh, at this point. It's understandable. Thank you. Any questions? I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for May 2018 in the amount of $23,420.77 as follows. Copeland and Page PC General, $5,650.77. Copeland and Page PC Labor, $1,634. Couple of page PC Water, $15,884. Thompson West, $252. Total, $23,420.77. Second. second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. June. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for June 2018 in the amount of $13,879.27 as follows. Copeland and Page PC General, $8,464.27. Copeland and Page PC Labor, $4,256. Copeland and Page PC Water, $1,159. Total $13,879.27. Second. Second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Town Administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, an update relative to the town's paving plan. Um, the area in the uh, Freedom Drive and Patriot uh, was uh, milled uh, and binder paving was uh, uh, conducted in late June and early July. That was a su successful um, phase one of our paving plan and I attached a copy of the public notice. The work's obviously complete. There'll be final paving that will take place at a later point in time. I included a draft list of articles for the October town meeting uh, with the report. We'll have a, a more updated list after the warrant closes on August 20th. Um, we recently identified that the funding source for a few of the capital projects that were approved in the FY 2019 budget was incorrectly identified in the warrant article itself. Uh, which uh, will require a correction at the October town meeting. So I've included a placeholder title and there will be an article submitted to the board for its consideration on August 20th for, uh, to, to, re to rectify that issue. Uh, it's been called to my attention that the uh, DPW's water meter contractor had uh, issued a round of notices with the town of Billerica seal on it. DPW has instructed the contractor to correct the matter. The public is thanked for its patience and we ask 
the public to respond to the notice uh, with the phone number on it when they receive it. And um, finally, just a comment uh, relative to a, um, a budget-related matter. Uh, in the fiscal year 2018 budget process, we had reduced funding in the DPW budget for the um, position uh, in uh, town buildings, uh, which was which is also which is simultaneously held by our assistant building inspector. Um, at the same time, we received a request from the building inspector. I shouldn't say at the same time. At the beginning of the fiscal year, fiscal year 2019, we received a request from the building inspector to uh, sustain the staffing um, at the uh, number of hours in that position that it had been at uh, for the past few years, which was 26 and a half hours. Um, so because we don't have those hours funded and because that individual was working both in the DPW and building, uh, we would need to make a, a, an amendment at the fiscal at the uh, October 2018 this year, this October town meeting in order to rectify those hours. Um, we have the ability to, uh, to sustain the staffing at that level because it is early in the fiscal year. If town meeting were not to address this issue by approving the transfer of funding in the amount of the seven and a half hours per week that we are um, asking, I'm sorry, the nine and a half hours, no, not seven and a half, nine and a half hours. If that were not to be addressed, we could address it through a finance committee reserve fund transfer or through the salary pool. Um, our recommendation at this point to, and our intention is to continue staffing due to the pace of work in the building department um, and uh, to address town address the issue through town meeting uh, in uh, in October. And that concludes my comments. That makes sense. I know the building department is very busy right now, particularly with the, the Pulte thing coming online. And I, at some point, we will be hiring some other outside assistance for that. Um, it, 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 largely in the form of additional hours worked by our existing part-time inspectors. Um, this position obviously um, uh, is the assistant building inspector. It, it is, uh, in total, it's more than a part-time uh, position. Right. It's a 26 and a half hour per week position. Uh, but the workload is actually exclusive of the Polte. Uh, Mr. Uh, I know Mr. Noel intends to conduct a lot of the inspection from the building end himself. But it's going to put more pressure on the work required for There's this position. There's also an awful lot of plans to review and sure. the time is going to be in. So no, I think it's, it's wise to uh, fund it now and go to town meeting and supplement it. Right. So, sounds good. Agreed. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Leary, we'll start with you tonight. See uh, if you wouldn't nothing mind. Nothing other than to all the uh, Boston Globe and Herald, All Scholastic, and All Stars, congratulations to them. I mean, yeah. we haven't met since uh, those things. Right. We had a, a number of uh, student athletes who were uh, prominently mentioned in the uh, in the papers and recognized, and that certainly uh, bodes well for uh, what we offer here in North Reading, but also to their ability and uh, certainly going to help them later on in getting into schools and all that. So congratulations to them, and I hope everybody's enjoying their summer. That's all. Mr. Masseri. As I said earlier, uh, now that I'm retired, uh, I have even more time. Yeah. <laughs> My goal is to get the sewer portion of the project to a point where we fully understand the directions that we're going. Yeah. Great. So I'm going to become a pain in the you know what. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important that we uh, take <coughs> advantage of the situation now before Randolph forgets. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, just real quick, I want to give a shout out to the town. There was a gentleman who was a dementia patient who got out of one of our facilities in town. And the amount of people posting on social media saying, look out for this gentleman, and really the sharing of it, the information dissemination by the citizens is, was top notch. And the gentleman was luckily found shortly thereafter. I just want to thank all the people that were out there sharing the news to watch out for this gentleman. It goes, shows what kind of citizens we have in town. Okay. You good? I'm good. I don't have anything. We have an executive session tonight. We do. So uh, to, um, I'll take a recess and I guess until we can get this. Uh, I'll make the motion, then we go recess. Okay. Sounds good. Which one is it? Is it uh, bargaining? Yes, oh. both. Oh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I move to enter into executive session for the purposes of Exemption 3, Collective Bargaining Strategy and Litigation. Such discussions in open session will have a detrimental impact on the town we don't need to admit anybody. Okay. And further, that the Board of Selectmen will return to open session for the sole purpose of adjournment. That's it. 
I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second, second by Mr. Minupelli. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Masseri. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Minupelli, and the chair votes aye.